Five seconds. And we're off. All right. Turn this music off here. Okay. So how's everybody doing? It's been another interesting week. Um, I have stayed pretty low this week. I haven't really done a whole lot. I've mostly been kind of staying low uh, until we get to the, the heart of the earnings season coming up here in a couple of weeks. We've got a Fed meeting. We've got earnings season. We've got all this volatility happening at, happening at the same time, and uh, I just wanted to be ready for it. Um, I've been seeing a lot of interesting memes floating around. This one right here, where the that's mostly in the crypto world, is looking at this two choices, either sell at a loss or hold to zero. I thought that was funny because that's the feeling in the markets right now, right? You got Jerome Powell over here just kind of looking at him like, what? What do you do? Don't worry about it. I got this. It's going to suck, but I got it. And this guy's trying to figure out, what do I do? Do I hold Bitcoin until it goes to zero or do I sell it at a huge loss because I bought it 50K or whatever, which is what a lot of people are actually doing. Slow fish me. What's up, man? How you doing? How you doing? Hope everything's good today. So let me get uh, to the markets here. I'm going to go ahead and move this out. This was kind of funny, but it's it's done now. Say bye-bye, Jay Powell. Okay, so what do we have going on here? Uh, we've got the S&P futures, which are flat, which is kind of what I expected. So pretty pretty much every week it's the same thing. There's not a whole lot of movement in the futures. You know, it used to be that the futures would move quite a bit before the market opened, uh, but now it's not really doing a whole lot. They're just kind of opening mostly flat, maybe up or down a little bit, not enough to really care. I used to actually watch the futures and I would see a huge move and know like, okay, we're going to have some volatility this week. Now there'll be these little moves and there'll still be volatility. So it's, it's just, it's kind of the way it goes though. I mean, people are so uncertain about things that making a huge move on the weekend right before everything starts may not be the best way to go. I mean, people are going to get locked into these positions and then Monday morning is going to come around and, you know, some official is going to come out and say something that's going to move the markets. It happens pretty much every week. And then those moves don't really go anywhere because they correct right back to where they were. I think people are just kind of nervous to be making trades on the weekend, knowing what could come up during the week. Uh, some people can profit off of it, you know, make a little trade on Sunday and then take it off Monday morning if it goes your way. But uh, to me, that's just too much risk. There's not really there's not a whole lot of fundamental reasons to make that i mean you could make some technical reasons depending upon where it is but like fundamentally i just don't see a reason to be trading on uh, on sunday so let me go ahead and pull let's take a look here just see everything uh we've got the s p 500 which is flat down here we've got the nasdaq which is flat uh we've got crude which is flat see crude usually moves a little more than everything else so that's kind of interesting that crude's not really doing anything um bonds they're flat uh, the dow's flat we got bitcoin over here at a nice oh 19 235. I love that. I love that Bitcoin is below 20K. This is probably one of my favorite things right now. There are so many people freaking out about the cryptocurrency space, but I love it. I've been waiting for like a year and a half to get back into Bitcoin heavier. And now that it's below 20K, I mean, it, it touched 18.5 not that long ago. Um, it, it's looking like a better buying opportunity. I don't know how much lower it's going to go, but that's kind of what I've been doing. I've just been looking every, at everything as a buying opportunity. I mean, we've got this free reign to pick stuff right now. You know, most people are thinking about the market as as a crash. They're thinking about everything that's happened this year as a crash. I'm thinking of it as finally a relief to get some buying in. You know, I've been I've been buying for the past couple of months very lightly, but as things come down more, I've been picking up. I'm still mostly in cash. I would say I'm like 60, 70, maybe 75% in cash now. Like normally I'm I'm like 40% in cash when things are going on because I, I, you know, buy uh, into my long account or I make trades that require some capital. Like if I'm shorting options, I have to have a bunch of capital set aside just to do that as the collateral. So a lot of times I'll have a low amount of cash and I'll be like, oh, I don't know what to do. Now is one of those times where I actually want to have cash, but it's I'm starting to deploy it a little bit. Not a whole lot because there still could be quite a bit of pain to come through. I really don't know, uh, but I'm I'm still just kind of staying on the sidelines. It's mostly a defensive play kind of a week. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize that. Let's pull up the spy real quick and see how we're looking. Um, so it was really not an eventful week. It was an interesting week, but it wasn't that eventful because really SPY just kind of traded sideways. The S&P really didn't gain or lose anything. It went, it went down a little bit, but then it kind of came back up. So let me go to the big charts and let's take a look at the SPY with all the technicals on it. Okay. 
Now we're uh, nice and zoomed in. So as you can see, last week we had that bounce. So right here, uh, I was predicting that we might have a bounce. I think, you know, I'm never sure about anything. Anybody that says there is is full of it. They really don't know. I, I just kind of have a gut feeling about things. And what's interesting is my gut feeling tends to be right a lot more than my head. I mean, in most situations in life, you're not really going by your gut. You're going by, you know, your logic, your reasoning, the stuff that makes you, you. But if you get into trading, you'll find that your logic and reason don't hold up very well. They're good for getting the reasons why you want to make a trade, but your gut is good at telling you whether or not you should actually enter the trade. And your gut has to be trained. So it's not like you're going to come in and a few weeks later, your gut's going to be right. It's you have to be trading for years and have uh, enough losses and wins to know or to at least have a feeling about something because your head will say, hey, this should go like this. This should go like this. Yeah, I know Beyond Meat should pop and drop. I know uh, Virgin Galactic should pop and drop. And all these stocks that you just look at their charts and their one direction charts, you know that that something's going to happen, but you're going to want to make a trade at the wrong time. That's normally what will happen to me when I make these little petty trades. See, the way I work is I make like little petty trades here and there, and that kind of satisfies my uh, uh, my itch to trade. You know, like when, when you have money sitting in your account and you're looking at the screen, you want to make something off of that money. It's very difficult to just sit there and do nothing. Right. If you have to not do anything, my best advice is to not even have your screen on. Go do something else completely. You know, let let your either let your position go and don't look at it or don't be in a position and just let the market do what it does and keep checking until you find an entry point for your position. You know, because a lot of times you'll get excited about something and the move that you, you think maybe it's going to reverse or whatever, but it's the move isn't done. So then you're thinking short term. The move keeps going for a few days. You're underwater. You don't know what to do. You think, ah, forget this. I'm just going to get out of it. It's not going well. And then the, it reverses and you could have made money or you could have broken even. But you didn't because you got into a trade. You're antsy about it. Your head said this should happen. And your head was right. But you just don't know when. Your gut will probably say, "Yeah, this isn't the time." And your gut's not perfect either. Obviously, you're gonna you're gonna miss some stuff out because of your gut, or you're gonna make wrong trades because of your gut. But it's a, it's another thing to add to the the uh, picture that you're building. I mean, I always like to have multiple reasons for making a trade. I want a fundamental reason. Uh, I want a catalyst, some news, and a, a technical reason if I can. And if I'm really lucky, my gut will also agree. So if I can get all five of those things together on one trade, then that trade's going to look good, uh, which is what I did a couple of weeks ago when we had the Fed meeting on, I think it was June 15th. I made a day trade that I don't normally do. At 12 minutes, I was up almost 50%. I got out of that really quickly. It was it's not my kind of trade. I don't like putting a huge amount of cash on the line and and you know getting out in and out really quick, basically scalping. So this was actually like a good strategic trade because I had everything lined up. My gut actually said this is time. That was really what did it. You know, I was thinking about I got in at the perfect time, like right as it was about to shoot up, which is also something I don't normally do. And I think it was mostly because of my gut. Not because I thought this was the time. My gut was saying, "All right, this is it. You can actually do it if you get in." right now, but be careful and get out quick. Like that was kind of the feeling that I had. And that's what I did. You know, when I was up and it kind of was stalling a little bit, it wasn't, it wasn't going anymore for a good few minutes. Uh, I said, all right, it's time to get out of this because it, my gut was saying, you know, take your gains. And I was partially right because it came back down for a while and then it popped again at the end of the day. So I could, but it really went maybe just a tiny bit higher. So honestly, I probably would have been around the same amount of profit if I had taken it out at the high a day. So not, not a whole lot more. I think, I think my, those contracts went down like 50 to 80 bucks a pop from the highs when I finally sold. So, I mean, I could have made a, a, a decent amount more if I had sold at the highs, but hey, you, you never do. You almost never do. I did it once by accident. I, I sold right at the top with Bitcoin when it hit 64K last year, but you know, I, I wasn't able to really time it very well after that. I'm, I'm underwater. My, my average is like just, I think I just got my average down into the thirties from the high forties. So it's, you know, I have some work to do and it, and I got lucky on that one, but not so much afterwards. But if you can get a good chunk of the move, like let's say you can get like 60, 70% of the move. That's wonderful. That's what I'm shooting for. You're not going to get the whole thing. Don't think you're going to get the whole thing. Be ready to just take little wins here and there and use as little risk as possible uh, if you want to stay safe in the markets. Obviously, I'm not a financial professional. I don't give financial advice. I just give my opinion. You have to think of everything yourself and you have to make up your own decisions for trading. And my suggestion is to just be careful. You know, If you have a good amount of money, talk to a financial uh, professional and have them help you figure out what to do with it. 
you know, but if you take a little bit of money and you want to do something on your own, see, that's, that's, that's what I think is a good idea. Like take most of your money, put it with a financial professional, put it in an index fund, whatever it is, you know, talk to somebody that figures out uh, or figure out the best way to, to deal with it. But you can use a little bit of your cash to make some trades on your own. And you, at first you may not do well. You may think like, oh, I could have just put that cash in the, in the, um, the index fund and it would have been a lot better, but it's kind of a diversity of strategies in my mind. You have one section of your money being managed by someone else that isn't you. You have it being managed in a, a basic passive index fund mostly. I mean, there's it's probably and when I say index fund, I'm referring to like any fund that's just a collection of stuff that roughly follows the market. And uh, you're going to have bonds, you're going to have stocks, there are going to be some hedges in there for downward movements, but it's mostly just an upward trending kind of thing because that's what the market does. But if you have a little bit extra doing other trades when the market goes down, like this because if you take a look at this graph right here this is a year's worth of time basically if i scoot it over a little more this high right here was the end of last year and this is all we've seen so the things i wanted to talk about today number one markets are going to be closed on monday july 4th obviously we just had a closure for juneteenth a couple of weeks ago so right now we're having a, a quite a few four-day weeks which i actually kind of like because it gets rough sometimes so it's nice to have an extra day to not have to think about things and you know the people that say oh it's like what crypto trades 24 7 why doesn't the stock market trade 24 7 because it would be brutal It'd be absolutely awful i don't want the stock market to ever trade 24 7 it's going to eventually i think because crypto blockchain i should say in general is kind of becoming like a new version of the stock market slowly i've noticed that crypto or blockchain is allowing people to buy shares and things that stocks don't don't allow you to do right you can make a share of anything and it could be physical assets digital assets whatever and you could sell it in the crypto marketplace and do it in a decentralized fashion whereas in the stock market there's still a group of market makers i mean they're not all in like one room colluding together but they still work in their own best interest and they're large entities so they're going to at least collaborate somewhat and we're not in that group you know, they're making money for them, not us. So having crypto be decentralized and able to uh, spread that around. So hopefully that consolidation of power doesn't happen for these other for this new market that's emerging. But I have a feeling that it will, you know, just thinking about human history and how things go. I kind of think that crypto is going to be not hijacked, but controlled at some point by by a central group. It's supposed to be decentralized, but you can centralize it. You know, for example, uh, bridges, right? Try to move one coin over to another. There are a lot of bridges that have dedicated people, nodes that make those decisions, which is a way of centralizing uh, cryptocurrency. Not to mention there are all kinds of security problems. I talked about them last week. We had that hack of Horizon and everything like that. But the things I want to talk about today were, one, we just finished the first half. So there's repositioning of large firms. People are thinking about what they're doing for the second half of the year. Two, I want to go over what's happened in the market so far. Three, we've got another Fed meeting coming up, which is extremely important. And four, earnings season. So we've got all those things coming up, and right now is, is a time to kind of wait. It's, it's, it's a time to scope things out and look for good entries into trades during earnings season. But I'm mostly I'm going to go over kind of the earnings season guide today. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to talk about how I approach earnings season and uh, what I do to make trades before and during. Because it's, it's kind of important to make sure you get good entries beforehand for my trading style. Um, a, a lot of people will sell options into earnings reports or uh, we'll just sell options in general, which is something I like to do. I like to sell options, but I don't like to do it into earnings reports. It, it, see, that's the probably one of the better times to actually sell options because the premium is going to get crushed, right? Volatility goes way up right before uh, a binary event, meaning something that you know is going to move the stock, which earnings will do especially if they guide up or down farther than previously estimated, that'll move it extremely. But it's good to get into a position beforehand if you're going long with options, if you can, right? So that's something that I, I would comp I would tell people not to do the strategy that I'm talking about right now because it's it, it's very difficult. I mean, even knowing how I how it do, how it's done, it's still difficult for me because you have to get in at the right time. You have to get out at the right time. It a lot of times it doesn't work, and you have to wait for a really really good trade, which is what I'm gonna do. I, I'm I'm using as much willpower as I can to make sure I don't get into a trade that I regret later. So let's get into everything. Uh, we're gonna start off with the macro news, then we're gonna go into stocks and crypto, which is kind of the normal format. Uh, I've been thinking of switching it up. But we'll see how that goes. So, number one, it is the second half. Now, I know that doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but to me, that is actually extremely important because one, we had quadruple witching 
last uh, was it last week or the week before that was the end of the quarterly contract cycles for uh, I can't remember all four of them but it's like futures contracts uh, stocks stock contracts um, something two other ones that I'm forgetting right now but that usually means that there's going to be high volatility because when you're coming to the end of those contract cycles certain people don't want to be in those contracts so they want to get out of them which will affect the market it doesn't always move a lot on those sometimes it does and it's it's good to check it out and watch it because you can get you know good moves off of that we've had a little bit of movement already so let me zoom in the contract cycle st- stopped somewhere in this area i think this green movement may have even been like right here at 17th um they're not listed anymore so i'd have to to look that up but uh, you, normally you'd see a line somewhere around here and then you look we've had that this big movement of course a good ch- chunk of it has retraced so we're kind of in the middle of that pattern but there was a move and you will see that people will readjust right in the end especially when we have high volatility because they're going into a new cycle we've got a fed meeting coming up we've got earnings coming up so people really don't want to be positioned in ways that can get them destroyed and the gamblers want to get themselves into something they think is going to make them a whole bunch of money which may or may not work we'll see this is a daily chart uh we've had an interesting week let's see this was friday thursday wednesday tuesday monday yeah so basically we just had a down week and then we kind of bounced right at the end which basically to me means we're flat right i mean we were up here so we've come down a good uh thousand points yes but in in my mind this range that we've had for the past few weeks is still holding right but we're kind of on a downtrend so i would expect either lower highs or a rejection when it gets up to the top here. So as I've been saying for the last few weeks, we are in an area right above a low volume section. So we are right here right now, which is kind of in the middle of this bump. You can see this is the volume profile. It shows you where shares were traded hands, like at what price. So you can see up here at the 442 price, most of the shares in this range were traded right here. I mean, the volume is like two, I can't even read that number on the screen. It's millions or billions, probably billions, um, right in this section right here, because this is a spy, so there's going to be heavy volume on it. Right below it, you can kind of see that there is a, a low, a lighter section, right? We just kind of bounced off this top section here. We're hanging down where the volume is starting to get lighter. And if we get down here, we could have a panic. And what I'm wondering is if we're going to get that by the time the Fed meeting comes up, because the Fed meeting is like the 26th or 7th or something like that. Let me pull up the calendar so we can take a look. Yeah, so the 27th, I believe, is the next Fed meeting, which is a few weeks away, so we've got some time. But earnings season is also starting right in here. It starts with the banks, and then it goes into everything else, which we have the the heart of it right here at the beginning of August, end of July. So the Fed meeting is going to be coming in right at the heart of earnings season, and that's what I've been waiting for. I mean, this is going to be extreme volatility because not only are we going to have reactions to everybody's profits or lack thereof, we're also going to have a reaction to the interest rate decision. I mean, we just had a higher than expected rate hike at the last meeting. So what are they going to do this time? They were talking about 50 basis points before 25, 50, but now we're 50 to 75. I kind of think they're going to go with 75 just because they have this really high target to meet by the end of the year. And we only have so many meetings to get to. I mean, there are analysts predicting all kinds of things. Uh, basically between 50 and 100 is what I'm thinking. So we could get half a basis point or I mean, half a percentage or a full percentage, which I wouldn't be surprised uh, if that actually happens. So we're waiting for that. We've got some time. So we've got next week or this week, next week and the week after then the Fed week. So I think the volatility is going to start coming in. Number one, after the bank's report. So I think the bank's report. Let me go over here to the calendar real quick. Tickers. Yeah. Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan right here. So we've got the banks coming in this week. Obviously, there's all kinds of stuff. Earnings has been going on, you know, nonstop. Basically, if you think pretty much every day throughout the year has some kind of earnings report, not always. But but I would say 99% of the days of the year, not counting the weekends, although sometimes they are on weekends, we'll have some kind of earnings activity. But the clusters of it happen in the middle of the quarter, right? So this quarter is July, August, September. So the end of July, beginning of August is where the heaviest traffic comes in. Right here, we're getting into the beginning of August. And you can see there's like 700 companies reporting on that Thursday. There's 400 companies reporting here. The week before, we've got 400 reporting on Thursday, 300 reporting here. So this is where really heavy earnings 
reports start coming in and the, the the way earnings usually goes i mean they can these companies can schedule their reports anytime they want but normally you have what i call the preseason right like bed bath and beyond for whatever reason will usually put their earnings out in the quote preseason so right before the banks get going because to me the banks signal the start of earnings season they're it's a and they're a good marker too because you have to think the banks are the the institutions loaning to a lot of these businesses so if they've been loaning a lot and they're getting paid that'll tell you okay money is coming from these companies they're not having trouble but if you know they're taking on more and more credit they're not they're paying minimum payments the interest is racking up whatever it is that'll give you uh, an idea of how the companies might be doing so paying attention to the banks during the first part of earnings season is important because they'll kind of give you a direction for the entire thing not always obviously there's always a caveat when you look at stuff like this but it is a good indicator especially when we've been going down so much that it'll tell us what we want to know, hopefully, during that first week right there. So we're looking at uh, this week, which is the week of, let me see, 13th, 14th. So yeah, the week of the 13th is when uh, things are actually going to get started. Basically, it looks like next week. Oh, okay. So we've got this kind of week, finishing up everything we did from last month and, and you know, dealing with the 4th of July holiday. So there's only four trading days this week. But uh, then we're going to get into the start of it right here next week. I'm probably not going to make any trades on these, although there are a few, like Citibank is a stock I like to I like to make trades on. I, the thing I like about Citibank is, is if it gets hammered after earnings and everything still looks okay, they're a nice short put. Because I, they'll usually bounce right back. Now, we're having a downtrend, so selling puts right now is a little bit more dangerous. So I'm kind of thinking I'm not going to do anything for the banks. I'm just going to sit there and see what they say because they might give me some insight into the companies I actually want to trade. So the week after that, uh, things start to pick up a little bit. looks like we get some earnings. I don't know if there's anything really interesting going on. Usually, like, Tuesday through Thursday are the days where the, the most interesting companies will report. So that's why I just kind of look and see. I'm not seeing a whole lot of tickers that I care about in here. In fact, a lot of them I don't know. There's Tesla, so that's reporting the week after the banks. Let's see the Thursday. Yeah, Thursdays are usually the big day. I don't know what it is about Thursday, but that's the day that usually has the most people reporting. There's really not a whole lot going on. that for Even though there's 123 companies, I probably won't do anything. I'm going to watch Tesla's earnings. So what was that on a Wednesday or something like that? Yeah. So Wednesday, the 20th. Oh, what do you know? They're, they love to do the 20th. But then the next week, that's when we start having the, the crazy reporting and the Fed meeting on Wednesday. 307 companies reporting, or is that 397? Yeah, 307 companies reporting that day. Also, the Fed reporting. This is going to be so crazy. I, I just, I want to be in cash right now. So we've got the banks. Uh, you see what they say. You're probably not going to do much unless you get a really good opportunity. Uh, then we've got the start of some companies that I'm not really paying attention to. Some people might, but I don't. And then the week after that, the week of the 27th, uh, that's when things are really going to move. That's probably when I'm going to be making my my big trades. I know I said last time I wasn't going to trade during the Fed meeting, but I might this time. I really don't know. We'll have to see what goes on. So that's what we're waiting for, the 27th. So these next few weeks, uh, this week, lay it low, not doing anything. Next week, banks report. See what happens. Get ready for the week after, or get ready for what comes after that. Week after that, probably nothing. But then the final week of July, that's when the action hits. So I'm trying to save my cash for these days right here. Tuesday through Thursday of the 27th will be where my, my cash is probably going to be deployed, if at all. Uh, because what we're seeing is, let me go back to the chart so we can actually take a look at it. What we're seeing is this downtrend holding up, right? Every week I'm coming back in. And I'm saying, all right, it looks like the trend's holding. looks like the trend's holding. And so far it has. It, eventually it's going to bounce. When, I don't know. But my guess would be after the Fed gets everything done this July and earnings season come out comes out. Because we, we have two possibilities for earnings. I mean, there's tons of possibilities. But two main possibilities that I'm looking for. One, companies are still not doing well and earnings will reflect that. So they'll guide down. That's usually what happens. If, if things don't look good during the earnings report, a company will guide down just to be safe. But they'll also do that because it helps them pop when things come back up. I mean, I love a good downward guidance. If we can get another earnings season that isn't very good. See, last season actually wasn't terrible, but the guidance wasn't good. So if we can get something like that, where the performance of the, the company is still solid, but their guidance is low, that's what I really want. Because going into the end of the year, when things start to work themselves out, I want to be in position for these companies to come back. Because we've had a pretty big drop so far. I mean, we peaked at uh, 4,007, or we'll call it 4,800, right? Just below 4,800 is where the S&P peaked, and now we're down at 3,600. So we've lost 1,200 points 
off of the SPY, or I should say the SPX. Uh, that's insane. I mean, it's not it's not as insane as people think it is because there are a lot of people that are panicking right now and they're not sure what to do, but this is a pretty good drop. This is a wonderful opportunity to get in and grab some stuff because we have a serious problem with inflation. I mean, look, look at what happened to the market when the fed really turned on the money spigot. I mean that back here in 2018, they were tightening and they tightened a little too much for that time. The market didn't like it. And finally they said, okay, we'll, we'll, uh, open the spigot a little bit and boom it shot up but of course then the pandemic happened which you know they're probably wishing they hadn't done that because then they could have had more power with interest rates right because while this was falling here's what people forget about that whole that whole deal while this was falling during the pandemic the somewhere around here i think the fed actually lowered interest rates to almost zero so they didn't do it down here where people want to say oh yeah this is no they did it somewhere up here and the market kept going i remember thinking like oh man that's their only tool which it's not you know that's but that's really what I thought at the time uh, that with that, because that's one of their main tools. What are they going to do? No, their main tool is actually purchasing bad investments. And that's what they said they were going to do down here. This is when they said, all right, we're going to start buying junk bonds from companies. And junk bonds are basically higher risk bonds that companies will put out because they need cash and they're struggling. Uh, it's nice because you can earn a, a pretty good yield on a junk bond. In fact, there's a, a ticker HYG and a bunch of other ones that are just collections of junk bonds uh, that you, you can reap the benefits of. But one thing that people don't realize when they're buying ETFs is there's also a, also a management fee. And depend, depending upon which one you buy, that management fee might eat into your profits enough to make it not worthwhile. So it's better to have, in my opinion, it's better to have a company you really believe in that you've known for a while to buy their bonds. And if, if you're going to buy bonds at all. Junk bonds, I would just stay away from in general because they're kind of risky. But if you have a good company and they put something out that's got a good yield, I you know I wouldn't blame you for jumping in on something like that. I don't really do that. You know I've got some solid dividend stocks that I like. My ideal setup would be that I have a uh, an index fund with some kind of a dividend payout, but I don't really have that yet. I'm working on that. I have my long portfolio. I haven't wanted to pull a chunk of that portfolio out and put it into a managed index fund. Uh, I've just been doing well enough on my own, and I really just don't want to get crushed one day, which is kind of my fear, and that's why I'd like to take a good chunk of that money and put it into an index fund. But for right now, I'm kind of simulating one, making one on my on my own, which is nice, actually, because it allows me, number one, control over things so I can dump stuff that I don't like, which some index funds, they won't do that because they have to have a they have to allocate a certain amount of holdings into each uh, or a certain amount of capital into each holding, and they have to have they have to meet certain requirements. You can do whatever you want, and that's what I like about that. I can go ahead and do whatever I want, and there's no management fee. Obviously, there is risk because I am not you know trained like the people that are in these index funds that know what they're doing, that are watching all the indicators, watching indicators I know nothing about. You know, they're watching the common ones plus everything else. Uh, so it would really be nice to have other people do that. That being said, most index funds don't even beat the S&P. They barely match it. I think of, of like 3,000 index funds, there was a study done recently, only about 20 of them, I think, something like that. It was like a double-digit number actually met or exceeded the gains of the S&P by itself. Like if you just bought a straight ETF like the SPY or something, you could have outperformed these hedge funds with all these MBAs, you know, working tirelessly to, to make as much money as possible. Um, but at the same time, it's still good to have those people working for you because they know what to do in, in crazy situations, whereas you might. You know, like I only have the experience of what's happened in the past five years. So, I mean, I, can, I study the past. But I haven't experienced it, so I really don't know if something crazy happens that I haven't encountered before, if I'll be able to actually do anything about it. Anyway, so the point is, we're in the second half now. There's a lot of redistribution of these index funds. They're trying to get in position for the end of the year. They're trying to protect themselves from what's going on at the Fed here in a few weeks. They're just basically just moving around, and that's why I like to take a look at the, the quarters and the half mark, because the half mark is a lot more important. In fact, you'll if you have a fund, a lot of times you'll get a, a half report. You'll get a yearly report, and you'll get a report at the half, which is nice. Because you, I, you know, if a lot of people just put money into index funds and they don't do anything, they don't pay attention to it. You know, they have a, they have somebody for it. You know, I just talk to my finance person and they'll help me. Uh, they'll do it all for me. I still think you need to know what's going on because you need to be able to call them up and be like, hey, what's going on with this? You know, and they can tell you if they have a strategy that you like. That's great. I really think you should 
research the index fund you're in more. Now, obviously, a lot of these are like 401ks and people get them through work and it has to meet a certain requirement or something like that. You don't have access to as many funds, so maybe you don't get the one that you want. And that's that's fine. That happens. It, having any fund that's decent enough is probably going to be OK. I basically just want to make sure that one, the business is not in trouble in any way. So most of these places will have public filings and you can take a look at their finances. And uh, number two, I want the people that I'm talking to to sound reasonable. There are so, there are people that are they're gamblers and they got very lucky and maybe they get very lucky on a regular basis, but they also lose and they lose bad. Right. Now, those are not the people that I want managing my money. Maybe I'm not going to make as much. I understand that. That's fine. I really want to be safe with that side of my strategy. If somebody else is managing my money, I'm not expecting to anything to go to the moon. I just want to know that in 20 years, that money is going to grow and it's not going to get destroyed by some random company going under like my long account could. My long account is good. There are businesses that are very well established and uh, I've done a lot of research into them, but it, anything could happen. So that's why I do want to one day have a managed index fund, which I don't yet. So we've talked about the half. We're, we're starting a new half which uh, is, is interesting. New contract cycle. Things are moving around. An assessment of the year so far. We've had basically just a downtrend. We've had these few pops, mostly because of the Fed or because we've just ha had so much downward movement that there needs to be a, a week to readjust. These moves never continue because there are always pe there are always shorts that are way up and they need to get out and take their profits. I mean, it's not just shorts. It's also dip buyers. It's also people that just say, assume that, oh, you know, it's gone down X amount, so it's going to bounce, right? And that's kind of a self-fulfilling problem prophecy because a lot of times that that is what will make it bounce people will just say hey it's time for a bounce and enough you know, firms will agree and do the same thing i want to make sure that uh when those moves are made i'm not swept under by the tide and that's kind of what i'm wondering is about with this next section because we have like i said we have earnings we have that rate announcement and they're all coming in at right at the same time and that doesn't usually happen so that's why I'm wondering, I'm, I'm less sure about what's going to happen. Like through this, most of this mess, I was quite sure of the direction and the market sentiment. Not, I'm not as much now. It, obviously, things have changed. We finally got the rate announcement that was expected, or I guess it wasn't expected until right beforehand, but that was able to be read easily. Whereas now things are a little tougher, right? It was very obvious with the chatter of the, the past, or I should say of, you know, the past month, what was going to happen when the interest rates came out. Right now, the markets have been a lot more quiet with the news stories. I mean, we had Powell's, whatever, finance committee or something like that. So there was a lot of news a, a week or two ago. And then, of course, there was the Fed meeting before that. So the, the Fed was talking about a lot of stuff. But this week wasn't as active. So I don't have a lot of chatter. Of course, as we get to the meeting, there is going to be more. So I'll, I'll hopefully have a better idea by then. But that's kind of what we're waiting for. So we're just laying low. All right. So the next thing I wanted to talk about, we talked about the July Fed meeting. That's coming up on the 27th. Really not sure yet what's going to go on. So I'll, I'll talk about that more as we get closer to it. But we're going into earnings, and today's broadcast was going to talk about how I trade earnings and what the structure is of earnings season. So there's four earnings seasons a year because there are four quarters a year. Every company that's listed has to report once a quarter. They have to tell you how their finances are doing and how they project their finances to be in the future. They need to tell you what they think their sales are going to be, what they think their earnings are going to be, their expenses, etc. The way you can trade that is you can either wait for the move to happen and then respond to it. I think my favorite is if you're if you're a long-term investor, if you're dollar cost averaging, Wait for a drop after an earnings report. Look at what the earnings report says. Make sure their company isn't in serious trouble. You know, a lot of times the, the company will just drop heavy because they didn't sell as many units as they expected, right? Like maybe they were expected to make, you know, do uh, two billion in sales and they did like 1.8 or 1.9, and the stock will just tank. You can just think, okay, well that if you look at the economic conditions right now, that makes sense that people didn't buy as many, you know, whatever. If it's like a luxury item or something, they didn't buy as many luxury items, so it would make sense that this company went down. But nothing fundamentally is wrong with the company. Their debt is still good. They still have the same vision. They're pretty much earning within a good range of estimates. They're not getting destroyed every earnings season. This this one is a little different. So that's a good buying opportunity. That's my favorite play on earnings season. If, if a stock you like gets crushed and the fundamentals still look good, buying that dip. Sometimes that dip doesn't last very long. You know, if it's a really good stock, usually that dip will either maybe it'll last a day a couple of days or the week, but usually what I'll see is the f the first day the report will happen, it'll crash. The next day it'll be a little volatile and then start coming back up if it's a good company. 
That's the thing. That's the caveat right there. If it's a good company, if it's an average company or it's not a very good company, then it's going to probably stay down a lot longer. But good companies will bounce. And that's what I like about the banks. So I was saying earlier that during the bank reporting week, I might hit Citibank. If Citibank drops low enough and the economic conditions look like it's going to be okay, then I might look at doing something like that for Citibank. But I don't like this downward trend right here. See, this is the, this is the problem because normally I'd be trading earnings seasons in an upward movement and downward moves on good companies would be caught right back up because the tide would basically bring them back and people would go, oh yeah, I remember this company's actually good. I just freaked out about that one little earnings thing. But this environment is different. The tide is pulling things down. So a good earnings report might actually get rejected in fact, one of the stocks I want to talk about today, when you get to the stock section, had that exact thing happening. They beat uh, EPS estimates, they beat revenue estimates, they guided up for the rest of the year, and they still got hammered. The reason? Well, analyst downgrades. That'll get you. I mean, that's one of the most important things. So we'll talk about that when I get to stocks. But just know that we're in a different environment. So buying dips for bounces is not as easy. So I'm probably not going to do that. I'll look for if, if there's a ridiculous drop, like if something drops way, way too far, even in this environment, it, it could be a good buy. I might look at something like that, but I don't necessarily think I, I will for the most part. I'm going to try to stay on the sidelines until something really good happens. I haven't really seen a Snapchat or a grocery outlet lately. Those are the plays I like where they, they get so beaten up and people hate them so much that they just look amazing to me. They're, they're ripe for a bounce. And that's exactly what happened. I made a good amount of money on both Snapchat and grocery outlet on their huge drops because I know those businesses, you know, I pay attention to their earnings. I go into, well, Snapchat, I don't really use Snapchat, but I'm familiar with it. But grocery outlet, I will go in there, you know, from time to time because I actually own stock in them for a while. I, I sold recently to take some profits just in case the, the falling tide takes everything down in my, my portfolio but they made me a good amount of money because I was getting in at the low 20s and I sold in the high 30s and people thought the company was was terrible when it was down there at 20 bucks a share. I knew that was too too low. And in fact, I didn't buy enough down there. I ended up buying most of my contracts when it got into like the mid 20s or so. But it was a good buy because it was just so destroyed. In fact, let me pull up the chart real quick so we can take a look at that uh, grocery outlet. So yeah, look at this. So this is a weekly chart. When it was way down here, down at 20 bucks a share after all these drops in 2021, this basically described grocery outlet in 2021. Nice little work its way up for a few months. Earnings, slam down. Work its way up for a few months. Earnings, slam down. Just keep happening and happening. Every earnings season was a bust. I mean, if you bought the dip after the, the reports, and then sold close to the next earnings season, you made a good amount of money. In fact, I held through this, and then I was worried about this next one right in, right here in April. So I dumped some shares somewhere in here, and I was right. It actually tanked below that. Um, I didn't do anything while it was hanging out down here because I didn't like the way the chart was looking. Because it was before having these nice curved upward movements. Very very uh, predictable, very clean. Uh, but right here, there was a lot of uncertainty because I think what was happening is these huge red candles, every single earnings report was uh, starting to weigh on people's mind. And this, your psychology is so important in trading. You have to be in a good headspace in order to make these trades uh, and, and you know go through some of these things. And I think getting slammed down so much each time was terrifying. So when the earnings report came out and the action hadn't really come back, people just dumped. They panicked. This candle right here is, is the perfect definition of a panic. It crushed through decent amount of support. I mean, you can see the point of control over here on the uh, volume profile shows that right at this level is where most people are changing, were buying or selling. And that actually makes sense because you can look at this price action right here. It wasn't going up quite as much because there was a lot of buying and a lot of selling going on at the same time. So once the earnings report came out and heavier amount of people were in this stock getting crushed down here told me that everybody is underwater right now. Very few people are profitable. I mean, I, I took a little bit of a hit on that first one and made pretty much most of it back. And I think I got... I, got out for break even, maybe a little above break even right in here. Um, so I wasn't doing too bad, but a lot of people were, were in pain. And once it started going down here, like after this red candle, I started buying in like in this mess because I saw it for a few weeks since these are weekly candles uh, stay in this range. And I thought, okay, this might be a bottom part. So I'm going to, I'm going to start uh, getting some 
some calls for an upward bounce. Of course, there was still some downward movement left in it. And through that, I was actually averaging down, which is OK if you believe in the movement. But you really have to be careful when you're doing that. I my Basically, my rule is I don't want to average down more than about like two or three times at the most. Like, I, really, I'd only want to average down once or not at all. Uh, but once you get to like two or three times that you have to average down, uh, I, I just I would rather take the loss, you know, or, or just or have a small amount in there so I can catch something, but just not be so exposed to that. So this this one was kind of getting towards my limit. I mean, you can see there was one, two, three, four straight red candles. Right. So an entire month of downward movement while I was buying. Uh, so right when I got to, when it got to the low, I remember thinking on this day that it hit twenty one dollars. This could be the low. This is this reminds me of that day. Uh, it, it was like March 23rd or something during the pandemic when there was a huge red day. Prices were lower than they've been in so long. It, it was a, an amazing time to buy. And I couldn't because my cash was locked up due to a Robin Hood error at the time. So, I mean, I used my I think I used my other account to get a little bit of it, but most at the time, most of my cash was locked up in Robinhood, and because of that incident, I moved most of my cash to my long broker and stopped and basically said, "All right, I'm going to only trade with $5,000 per trading account max. Anything above that is coming out and going into the long account because if I blow up, I don't want to lose a ridiculous amount of money." I mean, losing the, a, a trading account worth five grand would be really devastating to me, but losing my entire net worth on some stupid thing. No, I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing that. So I, I'm keeping the trades to a very low percentage of my, my capital just because I don't want to get hurt, but you need to have enough to actually make some money. So that's why I have the two $5,000 accounts. So that way I have enough cash to sell some, some uh, options or buy some options. And if I need to buy a few shares, I kind of can, but with $5,000 buying shares is sort of difficult. Normally, if you have, have a good amount of money, like tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, buying shares works better for you. Because if you think about something like the spy, you know, that's going to be what, like 40 bucks or something. I don't forget what the spy is at right now. 30, not 30 bucks, 40 bucks, uh, 30,000, 40,000 dollars to buy uh, one contract's worth of shares by a hundred shares. Yeah, that's not, that's too much money to be doing some, I mean, you can make a good amount of money if you do that, but I don't like risking that much. So I want to get the options and just have enough capital to buy those since options are extremely volatile and you could lose all your money quickly, uh, which is why I don't recommend trading options unless you know what you're doing. Uh, but if you do know what you're doing, they can be great, but they can also really hurt. And even when you know what you're doing, they can still hurt because they're leveraged. They move faster than the stock does. As delta increases, which is the amount that the stock moves per dollar movement in the security that it's tracking, um, you make more and more. So maybe the stock moves a dollar and you've got 10 deltas, right? So maybe you made 10 bucks on that $1 move for the stock. Yay. That's that's cool. But then as it gets closer, you make like 50 bucks, 60, 70, 80. And then eventually it gets to a point where you're making almost one hundred dollars per dollar movement in the stock that it's following. So if you're in the money, which leaps would be, that's why I like to buy leaps, long term expiration anticipation securities. But basically, you're just buying options with a longer date to expire so that you don't get hit with theta. Theta is the decay on the options, and that's why option sellers make money, because every day your option is losing money if it's not in the money. So if you have an option for a stock that's at $100, let's say you are you you bought a call option for 110 because you think that the stock's going to go up to 110 or beyond, that option will be losing value while it's not in the money. And in the money means that the stock price has come up to the strike price of your option, the strike is the the price that you're picking. Like the $110 option would be the strike price. Um, so once it's at that or above, and for puts it would be at that or below, then you're in the money and you're basically going to be making close to $100 per dollar gain in the stock because that's what an option is. It's 100 shares of a stock. So those 100 shares will, should be giving you you know, it's a, it should be giving you the same amount as if you actually owned the 100 shares. But there's also a premium on the option, so you can kind of make a little more or a little less, depending upon what the premium is. So, yeah, that's why I say making close to $100 per dollar uh, movement in the stock when your option is in the money, because... Uh, the trading of those options will affect how much you get. So maybe theoretically you should have made a hundred dollars 
for this move that you had in your option. But the sellers aren't going to let that go. They're going to try to get a little bit of a profit above that. So maybe the 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 op the contract is for sale at like 106 you know, but the bids are down at like 90. So you're not going to get that exact 100 mark. You're going to get somewhere in between 90 and 106. With any kind of thing, you're going to have that. That's called the spread. Stocks have that, options have that, everything has that. But the spread is what will either lose or make you a little bit of your money on that option. So that's why I say like there's the theoretical price of an option and then there's the the real price. And the real price is whatever the people decide it to be. There's the Black-Scholes model, which is supposed to tell you what an option is worth based on what the underlying security is at the time. Uh, but it doesn't matter if somebody won't sell it to you for that price, right? So if there's a rock that's worth $5 in a store, somebody wants to go into a geology store, buy a rock for 5 bucks. they say, all right, on the market, this rock is usually $5. If the store owner says, no, I'm selling it for 7 and there aren't any other stores to buy it there, or any other stores to go to around that have that same rock, then you're either stuck buying it for 7 bucks, or you have to pass up the opportunity. You know, so that's kind of how business works in general. We have price stability for the most part because of the way our economy operates. But if you don't have any kind of control over that, that's what happens in a market. The sellers will decide what they want to sell at and the buyers will decide what they want to bid at. You know, and it's not always what the market says it should be. It's whatever is going on in that local area at the time. So you, that's what you have to pay attention to with option contracts. So let me actually jump over to some option contracts real quick. Uh, when you're looking at these option contracts, you're going to see that I have a, I have all these stats here. There's, you know, the, the, the Greeks, Delta, Gamma, Vega, Theta. Those all affect how your option moves. And I'm not going to get into all that because that's a little bit above the scope of, of what I'm doing with the broadcast right now. But what I wanted to show you is Delta changes as you get closer to the money. So you can see th these are the strike prices right here. Okay, or actually right here. So these tell you what the option is sitting at. So basically an option is a, a contract that tracks an underlying security. In this case, a stock. So the option is going to move based on that stock. And you're going to say, how much does it move? Okay, so if you're out of the money, like right now, Grocery Outlet is at $43.50, which kind of sucks because I sold at like 38. So I could have made a little bit more, uh, but I still did well. So I'm, I'm happy about that. So out of the money strikes like this one here at 50, right? So that's only, you know, what, $6.50 out of the money right now. That's not that far. But if you look at Delta, it's eight. So that means if Grocery outlet goes from forty-three fifty to forty-four fifty. Your option will go up eight dollars, and if it goes down from forty-three fifty to forty-two fifty, your option will lose eight dollars. And the price of the option is somewhere between five dollars and twenty-five dollars. So that's the seller says, I'm not going to sell it for less than 25. The buyer says, I'm not going to buy it for less than five because it's not worth it. Both sides want to be able to make money. If the buyer can get those contracts for $5, that would be advantageous to it because that $8 move is much, much more than that. And the, the, the option contract can only go to ba to $1, basically. And it, I would say it can, it can go to, to zero. It can be worthless. That $1 usually means worthless because there'll be nobody selling or nobody buying, actually, when a contract is way out of the money and it's not going to move in time. But in this range right here is where you'd buy it. So let's just call that $15, right? So you can probably get this contract for somewhere around $15 if you're lucky, if, if there are enough sellers. So I want to look over here at the uh, the how many buyers and sellers this number is telling you there are 14 sellers and five buyers i believe or maybe it's uh, the opposite actually yeah 14 buyers five sellers because the buyers are on the left the sellers are on the right so there are 14 bids at five dollars and there are five asks at 25 and which means there are more buyers than sellers so it's actually more likely that instead of getting this for 15 bucks you'd probably get it for 20 or 25 and I don't know if this is one of the securities that only trades in $5 increments, because a lot of them do, but I'm going to assume so, because everything is is spaced either 5 or 10, you know, a 5 or a 0 in the in the, the final uh, digit column. So it probably does trade in increments of 5 bucks. Anyway, the point is, this delta right here shows you that if the stock moves a dollar, your contract will move a dollar uh, up or down, or your contract will move eight dollars in the direction that the stock moves. Uh, the other thing you have to look at is theta. This is time decay. Okay, so this is how much your option is losing every single day. So you can see right here these co these contracts expire on July fifteenth, which is not that far away. Where's July fifteenth? Um, so next Friday, these contracts have two weeks left in them, which is why uh, this is so low. 
I mean, this $50 contract is not that far away from 43 so it should actually be worth a decent amount. But because it's going to expire in two weeks, the market basically thinks that this is going to be worthless by that time, and they're not going to put any effort into it. So if you wanted to make a bunch of money and you were and you thought that the st- the security was going to move that much, then you could make a good amount of money buying out of the out of the money strikes in this time. But I don't think it's necessarily going to move that much. It's already moved up quite a bit. In fact, if we go over to the chart and take a look at it, uh, it's been doing nothing but upward movement ever since it ever since it turned around down here at 20 bucks. So you may say, "Oh, well, it's done nothing but uh, upward movement." I mean, it's going to keep going, right? Well, not so much. Look at where it's getting into. It's kind of hitting the top right here. This security IPO'd in, I think, 2019, so there's not a whole lot of data. But you can see every time it starts to get up into these high these high 40 levels, it gets a little too heavy. Very thin volume. Uh, people that are that bought in down here because most people are in at this level, which is why I like this volume profile. It shows you where most of the people's average is sitting. So most people, their average is somewhere around 35, which is, you know, not that far below where I sold. My average was like 25 or 24 or something like that when I, you know, dumped them in this mess right here. I could have held and make, made a lot more, but those contracts would have been worthless at that point. So I took my gains and was happy about that. But once we're getting up to this top where these these downtrends start to happen, these huge red candles, it might get a little too heavy and come down. So that $50 option in in the market maker's mind is not a good buy. And I actually agree with them. I don't think it's a good buy with, with two weeks left. No, I don't think that's going to happen. But if you have a little bit more time, so August, maybe. So that's a month, month and a half out. Uh, now the, that option is a little bit more expensive. It's between 25 and 50. But look at how many buyers and sellers there are. 189 buyers, 184 sellers, very evenly matched. This is nice. So this could, you could probably get this one for the mid price, depending upon how the stock is moving. And what I like to do is if I'm going to buy a call, I want to make sure I buy it on a day when the stock is down. The market is down. The stock is down. Everybody is thinking down. So they're pricing the calls cheaper. Everybody's looking at the puts. The puts are getting more expensive. Everyone's in there. But if I want to go long on an option, I need to be able to get it for the lowest price possible. Because the problem with long options is like 80 or 90% of them are going to expire worthless. And if it expires worthless, you lose everything you put into that option. And that option is going to be valueless well before the expiration date. So you might buy something with a couple months left and it could be worthless with like 30 days to go. And you'll think, well, why is it worthless? There's still 30 days. Well, because the market has decided that they don't think it's going to happen and there's just not enough time for it to turn around. As you can see right here, two weeks, only the degenerates want to gamble on two weeks. I mean, look at the, the option that's right next to money, 45. That's only $1.50 out, right? Which is very doable, especially if you look at how much it moves every day. So let's go to the daily chart. I keep hitting that. I'm not trying to hit that. On a daily basis right now, it's been moving between 41 and 43. So we'll say about 2 to $3 range a day. Yeah, this could hit 45 easily if it's it's only a dollar fifty away. So I could definitely see that happening. Will it happen though for sure? I don't know. We're at a point where the market's kind of being a little funny. I'm surprised that grocery outlet has continued as much as it has. In fact, let me take a look at the short interest. I haven't looked at the short interest in a while. Uh, it's actually really good to check out the short interest on stocks because sometimes that will actually tell you why it's moving the way it is. So let's go to grocery outlets. Uh, we're going to go to statistics. And we're going to scroll down to the stock price history, actually share statistics, and the short percentages will be down here. Aha, look at this. 10% of the float was short on June 15th. The short data usually comes out every two weeks, so this is going to be a little older. We don't have one for the beginning of July yet, so they really don't come out on time always. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So it's we got to take a look at that and just sort of take everything with a grain of salt. But right now, what I like about this is Grocery Outlet. In fact, let me see how many shares Grocery Outlet has. I'm going to move this out of the way real quick. Grocery Outlet right there. So what I wanted to find out is how many shares, how many total shares Grocery Outlet has. And my giant mouse pointer that I use to make it easier to see is covering it up so I can't actually see what it says. So I'm going to go ahead and try to move this uh, thing out here and then move this one here. Okay. So 96 million shares. That is not a big float. So t- we're going to call it a hundred, a hundred thousand just to make the math easy. So 10% of that would be 10,000 or you know, 10 million shares short. So 10% of the float, that's pretty darn good. Where is my, 
Yeah, it said the last time we reported, 10% of the, the float was short. So that's telling me there's a lot of fuel for an upward trend. If that if it's still 10% or higher, then I think those those option contracts are extremely likely. But right now it's been bouncing in a range. But if you look at the the you know the past few months, in fact, let me zoom in a little bit so we can see, it has been in basically nothing but an upward trend. So if you've been buying grocery outlet, you've been in a good place. Yeah, even these little consolidations keep getting wrecked because everybody uh, or 10 percent of the people that own this are short and why i you know why they're short i really don't know everybody's got their own reasoning but it, it, i'm wondering if it's people that don't live in areas with grocery outlets because grocery outlets are mostly on the west coast they haven't really gone to the east coast yet uh, i think they have somewhere like four or five hundred total stores maybe a little bit more and they're planning on eventually opening up some stores in the east coast but they haven't yet so they have plenty of room to expand they are good during a recession because they offer lower price goods. They basically buy the stuff that doesn't sell at other places or is about to expire uh, or what, or they can get cheap for whatever reason, and then they sell it to consumers. So that's why you can go in there during a recession and actually be okay. You know, people, lower income people are looking at stores like Grocery Outlet, Dollar Tree, Dollar General, and stuff like that to get those cheap goods or affordable goods, I should say, because they're not all cheap. You know, if you go to a dollar store, yeah, pretty much everything in there is going to be cheap and it's going to break easily. But if you go into a grocery outlet, you're, you'll find good stuff in there. You'll find like name brand things that are expensive in other stores, but maybe they've got two months left till they're expiring. So what do we got here? Barbarian Blast Machine 747. That is a glorious mouse pointer. Yeah, I, I know. I, I made it a little bigger so that you could actually see it, you know, because I was when it was a lot smaller, it was harder to be like, hey, look at this thing right here. People didn't know what I was talking about. So I made it gigantic. Uh, obscenely so. I mean, it like I said, it covers up the numbers. I can't see what they are, but at least it makes it easier for people to see. So gl glad you pointed that out because it's definitely uh, an odd thing. And every week I'm kind of making some changes. You know, I've only been doing this for a few months and I've been trying to improve quite a bit, which uh, each week I sort of have. But at the same time, you know, there's still a long way to go. So the mouse pointer, just one little thing in that chain. All right. So what do we have next? Uh, we were talking about the oh earnings season. So the structure of earnings season. What do you say? You love it? Ha. Huh? Yeah, good. I have I'm glad you do, man. It's uh, everything. Everything's going to be kind of ridiculous and boring. That's kind of my my philosophy right now. You know, every time you go and you look at any channel, they're always either being way over the top or they're going in with technical analysis into like astrology levels of technical analysis. But I want to come out and be boring, right? Be a little weird, a little boring because I want to bring you like the the actual the, I, the the less biased viewpoint. That's kind of my whole thing. Is I'm trying to be. Uh, I'm trying to cut my biases out as much as I possibly can and have it as open of a mind as possible because you really don't ever know for sure. And that's what I was talking about earlier with my gut. Like you don't know for sure. So your logic will fail you in the markets quite a bit. It's good to have a solid gut because it will tell you when you shouldn't be doing things. You know, recently I wanted to get into a few trades and my gut said no. And they added, ended up being a good move because those trades wouldn't have worked out. You know, they were little trades and they were kind of ones my mind was saying, oh, this should move. You know, like for what's a perfect example of that? Uh, uh, not Rite Aid, because I've actually been doing really well on that one. But let's say Virgin Galactic, right? Space, S-P-C-E. Look at this chart. It's disgusting. Like, you know that this chart is going to crash. Any any pop is going to be crushed because Virgin Galactic really isn't going yet. I mean, they're actually they're a real company. They have products but they're not doing any. They're about to do something. Their, their space flight, their main space flight, I think, was like postponed. And they finally did their actual initial one. R you know, Richard Branson was in there and everything. So they're kind of going, but they still have a long way to go before they're actually like a fully functional space tr tourism business. Uh, so in the meantime, you know that things are going to get crushed, right? They have to finish developing things. They have to get permits. They have to put whatever things up that they need to put up. There's so much work to do. So I don't expect this to go crazy, especially as the market is is falling. So my head was like, hey, why don't you put on some shorts if there's a little pop in this thing? Because you might actually do well. Because I did. I think back here, this this big green candle, I actually put a call on and then took it off. And somewhere in here, I put a short on and then took it off in here. So in my mind, I was like, oh, I know this stock. I could do this. But I was looking for, I think, a pop somewhere in here. Was this in May? 
Uh, no, it was closer to this. So, yeah, I was looking for a pop somewhere in here at the end of May, beginning of June. And my gut just said, no, don't do it. And, of course, the next week, boom, big red candle. So I was, uh, yeah, right in here. That's right, the 30th. So I, I was thinking about doing it right then at the end of the week. And I'm so glad I didn't. My gut kept me out. But my head said, look at this. Look at this downtrend. Look at where the green candles are. It's going to pop. And that's the kind of thing that gets you in trouble. That's what a lot of traders end up doing is they just say, like, oh, it's been down enough. It's time for a bounce. Well, no, because the market is still crushing it, right? It's got its own problems. It is a functioning company, and I do think in the long run, it's actually going to be a good buy. Uh, right now, though, they're just hemorrhaging money because they're doing so much research and development. R&D is a big part of companies that are starting up, and you have to make sure that, number one, they're putting the right amount of resource, resources into R&D, which they'll tell you that in their meetings and their filings. Uh, but number two, you also have to realize that they're going to hemorrhage money because things don't always work out. You know, if you're building something, you're researching something, there are going to be dead ends. There are going to be times you're going to have to start over. So I don't expect anything to happen soon, but since they've had a flight and they have somebody behind it who has a lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of connections, and is actually interested in making sure the business succeeds, I do think in the long run it actually would be a decent buy. Uh, I'm not going to touch it, though, right now. it's I have so many stocks that I want, and it's just not one that I'm going to get. But the point of this whole thing was my head said, hey, look for a bounce. But my gut said, no, it's not the right time. There was a little bounce already. You probably shouldn't do that. I mean, you can see right here, this little green area uh, was the thing that kind of made my gut say, nah, it's already had its little bounce. It, it doesn't bounce that much right now because the market is getting crushed. And why is the market getting crushed? Tons of reasons. Number one, inflation, the big one. Number two, the Fed. Number three, Ukraine war. Number three, or number four, shipping problems. There are so many things holding the stock market down. Number five, fear. OK, that's a big one. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is we, we talked about the consumer sentiment uh, report, the Michigan consumer sentiment or University of Michigan consumer sentiment report. That was like two weeks ago, I think Th that was down. It was at a low that it hadn't been at in a while. There's also the uh, what is it? The PCE. What is I forget what that stands for. Personal consumption expenditures price index. So that's it's a very it's a similar measure, but it's done by uh, was it the the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis. Um, the BEA, huh? That's why they're... I all right, cool. Good to know. Good to know the BEA. Uh, but they're basically measuring the same thing. Like what, what's the difference in the cost of goods that consumers or goods and services that consumers uh, are are buying? And, and they, it's since the last report, too. And it's uh, what did it say? It was relatively flat. I mean, it's, it was up up in May. It was like, like it was like 4.7 percent. Uh, I don't know if it's 4 percent up or if that's uh, how much it was up total. I didn't take good enough notes, unfortunately. Uh, but that's one of the things that the Fed is actually looking at. It's their preferred inflation measurement tool. So the PCE is kind of important. And uh, it was it was up a little bit. Uh, that's kind of the way inflation has been working. Every month we get a report, inflation is a little bit worse than it was before. And that's kind of the main concern of investors. Like, how bad is inflation going to get? In my opinion, now that the Fed has stepped things up, I think inflation is going to probably turn around a little bit sooner than people are expecting. But I'm not sure when that's exactly going to be. The big uh, timeline is see what happens now and and reassess everything in September, right? Because that's been the big thing. The Fed has – they've had two meetings, right? They had the June meeting, and they're going to have the July meeting. They had – I believe they had one in May also. But they, 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 so they have a bunch of meetings in a row where they change rates. And then they have a month off in August. So August will be – basically the time for the, the markets to work out everything they've done, right? So if the Fed pulls down the lever of inf of uh, interest rates, it doesn't just suddenly spark everything, right? I mean, it can because people will get excited, but it takes a little bit of time to ripple through the economy and through the markets. So everything we're seeing now, even if the inflation number is worse than it was last time, it isn't it, the stuff the Fed has done hasn't caught up yet. So I think that would be a good opportunity to make money. And what I'm really hoping happens is that the reports come in that in, like the next CPI number is massive. I, I, I want it to be as extreme as possible to scare the market into going down even more because that's what we want. We want the market to drop as much as possible. So I, I don't know what everybody's account is at and what your strategies are, what you're thinking, but we're in a point right now where we need to be okay with the market dropping.
That's what it's been doing, and that's probably what it's going to continue to do. I don't know necessarily, you know, week on week what's going to happen. Is it going to bounce? I don't know. I'm very unsure of what's going to happen during the weeks, but I do know that we have pressure coming up at specific dates. We have that July 27th Fed meeting. We have the start of earnings season around that time. Like, these are things that are set in stone, and we know they're going to happen, so the market is going to react to that, right? And the consequences of those are going to ripple through after. So to see what's going to happen, we're going to have to take some time. And that's why September is the month to look at. If there's going to be a reversal, I'm looking for September through the end of the year, possibly the beginning of next year. However, rates are going to continue to go up next year if the Fed stays on the plan that they just laid out. Right. So things could stay down for a while. Things could be tight for a while. However, the stock market is a forward looking instrument. It's going to look at things six to 12 months in the future, maybe a little more. So if the market thinks that the turnaround is coming, like let's say, you know, by the time September rolls around, we've gone through the worst of it. Inflation looks like it's starting to come down. Uh, maybe the Ukraine war cools off, something like that. Then we can start looking at, okay, is it going to bounce? Because the Fed is going to be data dependent. They're going to make their decisions based on what happens in the market, right? So if price, if the market continues to crash, continues to go to trend down until the Fed meeting, that will incentivize them to not raise rates as much, which will be bullish for the market. If the Fed comes out and say, hey, we don't need to do the 75 basis point hike or the 50, we're just going to do 25 because things are looking better. That would be so bullish for the market. I think a rally would start at that point. However, they're probably not going to do that because these numbers are going to look bad. They're going to come into the next meeting and say things still, they're probably going to come into the next meeting, I should say, and say things are still not looking good. We need to accelerate even more. And that would be even more downward pressure on the market. And I would be fine with that because that's what we really want. We want the market to go down as low as possible to squeeze out all the weak hands, and we need it to be attractive for people to come back into the market and pump things up. See, that's what happened in 2021. If I go back to the SPY here and then zoom out to a, a better level so you can see, uh, you can see that this whole second half of 2020 and the, all of 2021 was just straight up. And all the people that got into it have not experienced a downward movement like this. A bear market, they happen. Like, look at the past. Like, bear market in 2020, bear market in 2018, uh, same thing at the beginning of 2018, end of two, uh, 2017. Uh, you keep going back. There was sort of a bear market here in 2015. And actually, I, that's another thing I wanted to talk about. We have an election coming up. So you got to know what to do in the markets during an election. And this right here was uncertainty. So you can see that as the 2016 year came about and the, the election heated up, uh, people were very uncertain about the market. It topped out, right? So ever since the Great Recession in 2000, or when it ended in 2009, it was pretty much an upward movement. I mean, there were some bear markets here, bear market here, but they were small. That's basically all we've seen are these like, you know, three month-ish, three, four month bear markets, and then things kind of take off again. But the uncertainty of the 2016 election, because it was a huge election, caused the market to pause. There would have been a lot of policy changes to depending upon who took over. See, that's what people think. They're most most people who are not traders are looking at the market in, in a political way. They're looking at all the political things and they're getting angry about everything. But the market is looking at, okay, what is going to happen if either candidate is elected? And what do I do based on that? So because of the two candidates, they would have had completely differing uh, views on what should happen with the market. It just waited. People wanted to see what was going to happen first. And then when the election actually happened, which it should be right about here, yeah, November, you can see everything took off because those fears were alleviated. They thought, all right, we finally have a candidate who said, exactly what they want to do. It's a mar very market-friendly candidate, so the market pumped. And of course, this stuff happened when the trade war came about, and people were saying, "Oh, we don't know what's actually going to go down." So, uh, you know, with this whole trade war with China, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of this bull market. But 2017 was a nice little run. They had basically no fear. You can see it was on top of all the averages. It came up above the standard deviation mean. Had very green candles up until the trade war. Uh, but you can see that uncertainty, and that's a presidential election. So usually those have much more volatility than the midterm elections. However, in my opinion, midterm elections are almost more important because they're dealing with you know the, the congressmen who are more likely to make policy, more likely to do to make policy that affects different businesses. So this election is actually extremely important, and they're posturing for 2024. 
that's that's kind of the big thing. I oh, got. I can't get. There we go. Uh, that's kind of the big thing with this election. We have an extremely heated political atmosphere, and if you notice, political rhetoric has heated up in the past month. Right? Things have always been very tense. I mean, recently, I, I would say in the past like ten years, politics has really picked up, mostly because of social media and algorithms and stuff like that. Uh, but in the past like year or two, rhetoric has really sped up. And the past like since the Ukraine war, basically, uh, political rhetoric is insane. I mean, look at what's going on. There's protests are coming back in in full force like they were in 2020. There's a lot of angry people. Uh, But what we as traders need to do is need to pay attention to the market and put our politics aside. So that's one thing I really want to drive in right now is politics can get you in trouble in the markets, right? There was a meme at the end of the 2016 election where somebody said, uh, oh, I can't believe... uh, Donald Trump won. I'm going to sell everything because everything's over. He's going to crash the economy and destroy the world and all that. Uh, and what happened? The the economy did really well, actually, up until the pandemic. So that person that sold, they sold everything, according to their tweet, and they showed like a little uh, picture of, of their, their sale receipt. Uh, they missed out on huge gains. I mean, if you sold it, if I back up even farther, uh, you can see this was the dot-com pump. This was the 2008 financial crash. And this was the pump after Donald Trump. So you can see right here, things went crazy. Right. Part of partly because we had a good amount of money, but part but mostly because we had the tension of the election relieved and we had a very market friendly president come in that people were expecting would pump the markets. And he sure did. Right. Most of this was due to the, the amount of cash that was able to come in. But because of that fear being alleviated, the market was really able to go. So what are we going to what's going to happen with this election? Right. So we've basically got more of a Democratic control right now. And honestly, it used to be that, oh, it's like, oh, the, the the Republicans are business friendly and the Democrats aren't. No, they're both about the same. All right. So th- that's the whole thing. I say, get your, pol- your politics out, regardless of what you think of either party. They're both going to be market positive. They're going to say a bunch of stuff that'll tank the markets, but really they want to make a bunch of money too. I mean, have you seen there? There's a pic, I should find it. Uh, there's a graph of all the senators uh, trades and who made a bunch of money in the markets over the past years. And you can see uh, these senators made huge amounts of money. I mean, and that's, I'm sure their, their political decisions are partly why, because they'll be like, all right, we're going to do this bill, like a a green, a green bill, right? We're going to do something that has to do with energy and they'll put something in there for specific, that'll benefit specific companies. They'll talk about everything else. They'll use their own rhetoric. They'll fire up their base. You know, they'll do everything they have to, but they're going to make sure there's little stipulations in there that benefit whatever company they're invested in. And that's just how the, how the economy works. That's how the world works right now. I mean, is it perfect? No. Uh, but we should be able to take advantage of it as investors and traders. And that's why you need to put your politics aside. You need to make sure that no matter what happens, your head is clear so that when the market does something unexpected, you're able to deal with it. And these midterm elections are going to be big. So I've been thinking about what could be the big focuses, right? Right now, there's a whole bunch of political arguments that don't really have much to do with the market. Uh, It's more of social issues. But I think at some point, because I've been seeing a lot of stuff that's saying the power, the balance of power might shift a little bit. It's more, like I said, it's heavily, not heavily, it's partially weighted more towards the Democrats, but a lot of polls are showing that there could be a flip and it could lean more towards the Republicans. And if that happens, um, or it, because of that, I think the Democrats are going to be looking for rhetoric that will benefit them. And to me, I think one of the best things they could do, and this would be great because I own you know shares in this sector, is cannabis legalization. That's popular with both parties, and it's a market instrument. Somebody somewhere is probably going to run on a platform that's friendly to cannabis. And if they do, that will pump the cannabis market. So that's why I'm watching this election. I'm looking for industries that will be affected by this election, right? There's going to be a lot, they're going to be building, like if you look at infrastructure bills, right? What do they want to do to fix roads and and uh, and build new buildings and stuff like that? Well, there are building or there are companies that will benefit from that. So, I want to see what who's running, what they're talking about, and if any of them talk about something that affects me like cannabis, which I have an investment in, then I'm going to watch them closely. So, right now cannabis has been getting destroyed, which is why I actually really like it because it was getting destroyed before everything else. Uh, let's go to the MJ and see what that's looking like. Oh, look at this terrible, terrible chart. This is a $5 stock right now. It's at all-time lows. I have never seen the MJ this low. 
And the MJ is made up of a bunch of different cannabis companies, but also some tobacco companies. It's a little bit more uh, broad than some of the other ETFs, but it's the biggest ETF. So I was invested in that because it will it will move with the cannabis market. Now, it's not going to move as much as individual stocks because you can see the high up here was 45 bucks, whereas in some of these companies, the high was like 300 You know, So if you're in, in individual companies, you can make a lot more. But the index is good because it will allow you to catch the momentum of the trend. And that's what I really want to do. I'm just trying to catch trends. I'm not trying to catch like perfect trades. You know, some people want to get this candle right here. They want to ride it to the top and sell it right here. That's not going to happen. Right. I just want to catch something like I want to buy in this area and sell in this area wherever. Like even if you're holding through all this and you get a little panicked right here, you're still up if you bought it down here. And look at how low this is right now. You know, every cannabis stock and every cannabis investment is looking like this. So this is actually, to, in my opinion, uh, a good buy for the future. I've got long-term option contracts in canopy growth. I've got shares of different ETFs. Um, I'm looking into some, some, uh, some options for a few other companies. Basically I want to be heavily weighted into cannabis with a safe amount of money if things turn around, because election years are usually when cannabis pumps. I mean, if you look at these pumps, you can see one of them was in 2018, which is when Canada legalized marijuana recreationally nationally which was huge. And that pumped the stock. But you know what was interesting about that? Uh, when it pumped, the day after everything was announced and, and put in, it, it's not put in right away, but the day after it, it was announced that these uh, measures won, uh, it, it dropped. There's a there's a saying in trading, buy the rumor, sell the news, or buy the rumor, sell the fact, whatever. There's a whole bunch of different versions of it. But it basically means ride the hype up before the event happens, take your money, and then get out before the actual event takes place. Because once it takes place, there's probably going to be a dump. You know, the traders know that it doesn't always continue to go. So they're expecting a dump and it's going to be a, a self-fulfilling prophecy because most people holding this are are knowing that like, all right, if I get a spike, it's time to sell because these spikes don't last and uh, they will. And they'll trigger a huge downtrend, which is why you got to be really careful uh, when you're buying something. And you always, you, as a rule of thumb, want to be out before the event just because you don't want to get crushed by what happens after. Now, that isn't always the case. There are times when things continue to go up. If it's a good company and things are happening continuously, then it's probably not, the, the dump isn't going to last very long. But for something like cannabis, it's still illegal in the major market of the United States and a lot of countries around the world. Most of the companies in this MJ and these ETFs are located in Canada and some are in the, UT, in the US or other areas. But a lot of these are Canadian companies because it's legal there and they're able to do what they need to do. In the United States, a cannabis company can't get a loan right now like you as a bank you legally can't loan to a cannabis company without special provisions because it's federally illegal even if cannabis is legal in the states which it is like uh in california where i live it's legal it's now legal recreationally medically all that stuff uh you can grow it but there are rules you can only have so many plants they have to be you know at a certain place away from the street whatever so there it's, it's not perfect or anything but it's it's still legal in the state. And there are other states that have legalized it too. In fact, on this ballot, from what I looked at a while ago, eight different states had cannabis measures on their ballot, which is why I think cannabis as a sector will pump later once we get closer to the election, because the people that are in power are threatened right now because the, uh, they, they could lose their seat, which is why they're going to look for anything they can. That's popular with as many voters as possible. I'm sure there's going to be a whole bunch of, of emotional rhetoric because that's what we've been seeing lately, like a pump up in the emotional political rhetoric. But if you look at the actual, the meat and potatoes of what they could do, cannabis would be perfect. I think like 70% of the country is in favor of cannabis legalization on the federal level, possibly more now. And I think the people that aren't, they don't hate it. You know, like there are always people that still do hate it, but they're kind of, they, they accept it now because it has industrial use. Hemp is, is so good for uh, paper, for wood, for different building materials, for other materials. Uh, it's not just about the, the cannabis, the THC and the CBD and all that, but you can look into that too. There's medical uses. The CBD is very good for pain, things like that. THC is also good for things like sometimes anxiety, but not always. Some people respond differently to it, but there are medical uses for it. There are industrial uses for it. So the people that hate on it, I think are mostly in the era of the reefer madness movie. I don't know if any of you have ever seen reefer madness, but it's basically a, uh, uh, 
a, a propaganda film against marijuana. It shows people smoking and then freaking out and doing all kinds of crazy things that you wouldn't do if you actually smoked cannabis. But that was the popular medium of the early 1900s. I mean, cannabis was demonized for quite a while, and a, a whole generation of people were turned off to it because of that propaganda. And I think a lot of those people have come around, but some of them are still in effect, although they're in usually in the older generations. I mean, there are people in all generations that don't like or do like cannabis, but as time goes on, it's becoming friendlier and friendlier. So my point is, it looks like a good target for something for somebody to pick up in this election. And if they do, it'll pump. So that's why I'm looking at something like that. So you also have to realize that election years are volatile in general. Plus, we have everything else. We have inflation. We have the war. We have the Fed. We have the shipping problems. We have everybody's fear. So everything is pushing down on top of the on top of the already falling cannabis market. So when you see a stock that's getting destroyed like this, pick any cannabis stock, right? So we got the MJ. Let's say CGC, Cannabis Growth, one of the bigger ones. They're getting destroyed. What about Tilray, T-L-R-Y? They're getting destroyed. What about uh, Cronus Group? They are getting destroyed. You pick it. Oh, how about Sundial, right? People love Sundial. Love penny stocks. Um, getting destroyed. Uh, but what I understand about Sundial, I've actually never really seen their products. I don't really go to uh, cannabis dispensaries, but I have a fan, friend that does regularly, and he basically speaks for Sundial. He says their product is actually really good. Uh, the, the problem is they, they didn't treat their stock well. They diluted it too much. Uh, they're also in the market that's getting crushed. It's just when you dilute your stock like crazy to make money to you know run your business, you run the risk of turning it into a, to this, right? This is a 33 cent stock right now. There are people that won't even look at penny stocks because they don't want to see anything that's a, like below $5 or below a dollar. That usually means that the company's in trouble. And uh, is Sundial in trouble? I don't know. Their, their financials aren't great, but they're not the worst either. I mean, they're in a they're in an industry where they need to borrow heavily, but aren't able to do it in this country. Although I mean, most of these are you know can, Canadian based, but some of them are U.S. based too. I mean, they're able to sell legally in certain ways. They but the problem is if you take a bunch of value out of your stock, the shareholders aren't going to like it. They're going to want to get out of your stock. Traders aren't going to want to mess with it, and you end up with something like this. So I really don't know personally how good of a company Sundial is, but from what I've heard about the product, it's interesting that their stock is that low. And I think federal legalization will help. Because because then more people will become familiar with these products. I mean, I don't really know any of them, right? Like cannabis for me has always been since I live in, in California, it's just been tons of people grow it. I mean, everybody, whether you smoke or not, you probably know somebody that grows it and has an ex has a surplus that they don't know what to do with. Right. So cannabis has always just been kind of something that's around. It's not, it hasn't really been something you have to go to a store to buy. However, there are a lot of places where that's not the case. There are areas where it's been illegal for a long time and there's still a lot of stigma around it. So it's hard to get, and they will have to go to these places and get familiar with these brands. And I think if federalization or federal legalization happens, more people will be able to do that. You can really buy almost anything in the cannabis space and catch that move if it happens, but it's better to be with a company that, that you trust a little bit more. As much as people like Sundial, I just don't know enough about it to really recommend it or do anything. And obviously, I'm not going to recommend any stocks. You have to come up with that on your own. But I can just tell you my opinions and what I like. The thing I like about Canopy Growth is that they're funded by Constellation Brands, which actually I am going to be talking about in a little bit because we're going, we're getting into stocks and I've got them on the list. They reported earnings um, and they initially, like uh, three, four years ago, they put a $4 billion investment into Canopy Growth. Right, so Constellation Brands is the company that makes Corona and Modelo, uh, the imported South American type beers. They do well. They're a good company. So the fact that they like Canopy Growth and they invested money into it tells me that it's at least legitimate enough for their accountants, their you know intelligent MBA type graduate accountants decided it was a good idea. The board of directors who are in the business of you know making money for companies also decided it was a good idea. It's not just some random sham company. They decided, hey, this is a good buy. So I like the fact that it's backed by Constellation Brands. But because of the market, it's been getting hit and it's way down there. It's at $2 right now. I mean, this thing was floating around 10 bucks not that long ago. This thing is destroyed. Everybody is underwater. The point of control is up here around 20 bucks because actually that was where it liked to hang out for the longest time. If you look at how volatile this chart is, it was coming back down to that 20-ish level frequently. You know, you can see right here, it went way up and it spent a couple of months up here, but it came right back down. So I'm not surprised that this is the point of control because when I would look at it on the daily basis, it would be somewhere around here for quite frequently. But now that it's at $2, 
Oh man, I love it. I mean, I, I, I like the whole cannabis sector in general. I've been picking up crypto and cannabis shares as time goes on, just because they are the most beat up. See, that's what you. If you're a long investor, the thing you have to look for is the stuff that you like that's beat up the most. But things that are beat up are beat up for a reason, right? There are very smart people that trade these things, and they have decided that these are not good stocks in the short term. But if things change down the line, like I said, the stock market is a forward-looking instrument six to eight or six to 12 months in advance. If it looks like it's going to pick up by then, then people will start investing. And I think at some point, if the rhetoric for cannabis comes out, then uh, this all of these stocks will be lifted up just because that's what happened the last time. I mean, these big pumps right here that came from hype in the cannabis market. And then once the hype died down, it went away. This last one that peaked up right here, what was this in... Uh, 2021, I'm assuming. Yeah, early 2021 when GameStop and all that other stuff was going on. Uh, that was the last time we had any positive news on the cannabis market. So we've basically been in a year and a half bear market well before everything else. So, man, I, I love that. If it gets crushed, if canopy growth becomes a literal penny stack that like goes below a dollar into those, like, you know, cent ranges, I'm going to buy so many shares of it. It's, it's unbelievable. You never know because things might not work out that way or it might take longer. So there could be better investments of my money. But as far as things getting beat up, crypto and cannabis are the two most beat up sectors out of everything else because they were already getting hit before everything else came down. So I'm liking that sector a lot. All right, let's move on. Let me see if I covered everything here. Oh, we didn't talk about China here. All right, so real quick, China and Russia, before I get in there, uh, Chinese stocks, they're cracking down on scam investing platforms. It's beneficial to some companies, but it's kind of hurting them right now. The Disney theme parks are reopening in Shanghai, which is a great sign because China's zero COVID lockdown policy has been affecting the markets. Like one of the big reasons we're having shipping problems is because so much stuff is closed and China it exports a huge amount of the world's goods. I mean, you got to realize the United States isn't the only place going to China for cheap goods. Like pretty much everywhere that can is buying them from China because China has a system set up to make things cheaply. So the fact that they're closed down is really hurting and as they open up even if other countries that produce things we need are closed it's still going to pick up quite a bit because they're kind of a major uh, exporter so the other thing i was talking about was russia russia's got a few things going on right now what is it the, the g7 summit or whatever with all the you know the world leaders showing up they basically decided they wanted to put a price ceiling on russian oil they want to make it difficult for russia to make money off this extended oil price but my question is all right how are they going to do that are they going to sell their reserves are they going to like force companies to no they're basically going to do their best to put a price ceiling on to make sure that russia can't make money but they're going to have to have enough product to do that and if they run out of products then what happens the price goes back up. So is this going to work? I have no idea. Oil right now, in fact, let me switch over to the oil chart so we can take a look. Crude light is just, oh man, it's on fire right now. I really wish I got in when, when things were negative down there because it's been looking great. It has come down a bit. Uh, so it's been, been about three weeks that it hasn't really, it hasn't been at its peak, but that's okay because look at how high it is. It's way up there. If this price ceiling thing can succeed, then that will actually be a little bit bearish for the oil sector. I don't necessarily think it will be because we have such a shortage already and we're already, every, every country in the West is trying to adjust who they get a certain percentage of their oil from because Russia supplied quite a bit. I mean, the United States, I think they only had like, I think they went from like two to 3% of their entire oil imports coming from Russia. And that was a few years ago or something. I don't know, but it was, that was the most it's been in a while. And they cut it, we're cutting it down because you know, of everything that's going on in Ukraine, the UK though, they had to get something like half of their oil from Russia. I don't know what the exact number is, but they, they're going to have a, a much harder time enforcing that price ceiling. Um, so I don't know if that's really going to hurt oil that much. The other thing that was happening with Russia, or, or this, I should say the other thing that's happening with this oil price ceiling is it could benefit India and China because it kind of incentivizes them to comply because it could be cheaper than what they're getting. Right. So they're they're still getting oil from Russia and they're one of the bigger buyers of it. And, you know, that's how Russia is able to fund everything right now, besides whatever else they're doing. But if we can incentivize their biggest buyers to come over and buy from the other conglomerate, then uh, it could actually hurt them. But I don't know if it's going to. Oh, so the other thing was OPEC agreed to increase the August supply by 680 barrel or 648,000 barrels a day, which is good. So the production is increasing. The other thing that's going on with Russia is their gold imports were already banned. That's one thing that was hurting their ability to make money. Uh, and they defaulted on $100 million of debt for the first time in a century. So ever since, you know, Russia was like a kingdom or whatever, they've basically paid their debt, even when they were the Soviet Union. But they finally 
it, within the past week or so defaulted on their first loan in a long time. I mean, that's a big statement. That's showing that they're either number one, not able to pay, or number two, trying to make a political statement. I think it's both, honestly. But it's showing you that th- this war is taking a toll on them. You know, like whether or not they could actually afford to repay that loan, I don't know. But as time goes on, it'll still be it'll be harder and harder for them to make money because every way that they're using to make money, the UN or whatever bo- governmental body meets regularly is trying to uh, stop that. So we'll see what happens in the in the case with Russia. So okay, so here's another interesting thing: Russia is banning rice exports from July 1st to December 31st, which could pump the uh, the rice futures. In fact, I put them on my list over here somewhere where they go. Yeah, RU2, right? Is it, yeah. ZRU22. We got the rice futures. So they've been down, but they're somewhere around the point of control. And uh, I could see them pumping because of this. I'm going to watch it. I don't really trade futures, but I would I would look into something like that if if the trade looks good. Uh, this could pump, but it depends upon how much rice other exporters are able to uh, increase. Like if other exporters are able to increase their amounts or their, their export of rice, then, uh, you know, that could basically eat the expenses of the Russian ban, which may not do anything. So I'm watching rice, but uh, it's looking like an interesting situation. Oh, Putin also said there's no use in setting a war end date. Russian troops are the reaching objectives, you know, so they're basically saying we're not going to say when we're going to be done. We're basically going to be done when we've reached all our objectives. And I know they've reached most of them already. So it could be that this war and sooner than we think. But I actually, part of me believes that this war isn't really about Ukraine. It's more about some objective that we don't know about uh, that they're trying to achieve. Because you think, why would Russia do something like this, right? They they knew that the rest of the world, besides a few allies, was going to shun them, was going to stop, was going to make it hard for them to uh, exist, basically. And that is exactly what happened. So my thought is he knew that was going to happen. And he, so what is it that he actually wants? Do they do they want a bunch of Ukraine or is there more to it than that? I really don't know. So that's why I keep watching this in terms of the markets, because things could change on a dime if, you know, whatever objective they they are trying to achieve ends up coming to fruition. So I want to make sure that I'm in position if things turn around, because the Ukraine war is one of the major things weighing on the market. So my hope is during this next earnings season that the Fed gets everything out, you know, that they need to get out. The market resets because earnings come in at whatever. Maybe they're not as good as we thought, which I'm hoping. So it tanks the market more. And then the Ukraine war comes to a head. If we can have all that happen later in the year, the the bull market that comes after that will be massive. I mean, we, there is so much upward pressure waiting to be released because the downward pressure has come in so strong in the past few months. Um, so that that's what we're watching. We're watching Russia, see if that ends. We're watching China because they're they're one of the th- people that number one is de- has the biggest uh, shipping problems in the world, basically, and holding things up. And they're also kind of an ally to Russia, so they're a way for Russia to continue doing operations. So we got to watch the, uh, what happens with Russia, got to watch what happens with China, and, of course, what's happening with the Fed. Um, so that's what we're going to get into next. We're going to get into some stocks and uh, how they're going to be affected by the Fed. So the first stock I wanted to talk about was Robinhood. We had an upgrade Finally, to Robinhood. Now, Robinhood IPO'd recently. I actually, uh, oh, I owned, I still own a few shares in Robinhood, but I, the last time we had a nice little pump, I dumped out of it. So right here, you can see there's a, a pretty big green candle. Uh, I got out in that. I, most of my shares I dumped right up here when it was around 16 bucks, and I kind of rode the rest down. And I dumped them somewhere around 12. I don't know. I think it pumped over here. So I, I kept very few. And into this little pump, I sold about half of what I had left uh, just because I, Robinhood makes most of their money from payment for order flow, which basically means that they send their orders to another company to be filled. And uh, they that company can skim a little bit off the top, which is why they're willing to pay Robinhood for that. And uh, the SEC came out and said, you know, we're going to probably regulate that. This seems we don't know how this is going. There's not enough transparency with these uh, payment for order flow deals. So we want to set some standards. And if they do, that's going to hurt Robinhood because their big selling point is they're they're free because they make their money elsewhere. They don't have to like, you know, nickel and dime their users like some 
companies do because they're getting their money from the payment for order flow, you know, but if that changes, then they're not going to be able to make as much money. So I'm watching that uh, Golden Sex upgraded them to neutral from sell, but they dropped the price target to 950. Now, my average is well above that. My average is in the teens. So I'm, I was hoping for a price target up in the teens at least. But because we don't know what the future of Robinhood is going to be, how they're going to make money if the SEC changes these regulations, uh, it's just not a good buy right now. That's why I got rid of those things on a bounce. And I do think in the future that they'll figure something out and their, their stock price will come back, You know whether it comes to fruition or not, I don't know. But I, I am pretty – my thought is that they're going to say something to pump the stock eventually. So I'm watching it for that kind of a thing. But unless they can solve the payment for order flow issue, they're kind of just floating in the water right now. So I'm not, I'm not paying too much attention to them until they do. All right, so the next stock I wanted to talk about was Kohl's. They had a huge movement the other day. Now, a lot of times uh, – Companies will move on buyout news, right? And I think there's somebody there was going. Okay, so they were going. They almost reached a deal with Franchise Group for fifty dollars a share, right? But you can see right now the stock price is at twenty eight, and it's gone down a bit in the fa past few days. But look at the range of this. I drew these lines when I first started trading or years ago, right? So this range has held really well. I, this was this is the kind of technical analysis that I'm kind of like, eh, you know, it's all right. I could take it or leave it. But uh, it actually held up pretty well. I mean, it bounced off this 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 bottom section of support quite a few times. Uh, it, you know, consolidated in these channels. So it, the stock price is volatile, but in somewhat of a range. And fifty dollars was eh, right around the point of control. So that's probably why they picked that that point. That seemed like fair value. For the past few months and actually the past few years, $50 is kind of the price that it hovers around. If we back up a little bit and look at that, that trend again, you can see that if I put the thing on $50, it kind of goes right around it. So it's like this, it would go above it, come back down to it, go below it, come back up to it. So I this is a this is a very reasonable price to offer. However, when things went down, they said, eh, I don't know if I want to do that. Oh, that's what it was. So they didn't pick, they wanted originally to do $60 a share and they dropped it to 50. I think that's, that's what it was. So yeah, franchise group dropped their offer to, to 50 from something like 60. Uh, but Kohl's still wants that 60. So where would that be? That would be up here. So if you're looking at 60 bucks, that's more towards the top of the range of where Kohl's has been trading. So in my opinion, that's a bit of an overpayment right here. Like, I think the 50 is fair. I honestly think if you were a buyer, you'd want to get it down here, like 45, 40, just because it's in the lower end of the range. Uh, but 50 is a fair offer. Coles wants more. They're probably not going to get it. So I don't know if this deal is going to go anywhere. However, if you look at what happened in the, the chart and the price action, when that came out, boom, they just gap, they gapped down a little bit and just trended to the bottom of this range. Well, not the bottom of the range, but trended down into this lower range here in the 20s. Because that if that buyout deal is off the table, then shareholders aren't going to make their sixty or fifty dollars a share. So if the offer comes back, or no, the offer stays at fifty, and Cole says, "Okay, we'll accept it at fifty, the stock will instantly bounce to fifty, or at least close to it, because that's what you'll see when a company gets bought out. The share price needs to match the buyout price. So you can make a good amount of money if you're able to get in before those kind of things happen. However, there's a lot of risk, as you can tell with the day that the deal fell through. So I don't like to play buyouts. Some people do. They're just too uncertain for me, right? I'll play. I, I would play it with a little bit of money, but I'm not gonna use a, a good chunk, a good trading chunk of money to to play a uh, um, a buyout. They're just not. It's not gonna work. The other thing that happened was uh, and they guided down further. So it wasn't just that the buyout canceled. They also said, "Hey, I know we already reported earnings, but uh, we're gonna do even worse than we said during that call." The one thing they did say, though, is they reiterated their 500 million share buyback plan. So that means they're going to want to spend $500 million, I think, in, a, in the next year or so, buying back some of the stock and hopefully propping it up a little bit. Um, so that is kind of bullish. Like Kohl's, they bounce frequently. So I, as a swing trade, I can see Kohl's being a decent deal. In fact, I'm keeping it on my list right now. Uh, I've got my Sunday night finance list down here with everything I've been talking about for the past like month or two. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on this one because look at that percentage drop down here. 19% in a day. That's huge. So they're definitely something I'm, work, um, I'm looking at. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was General Mills. They reported earnings. It looks like they did really well, actually. You can see right here that this was the day they reported earnings, and then they had a huge pump afterwards. And that was because they came in above estimates. So their earnings per share, EPS, came in at $1.12. 
uh, per share, and the estimates were a dollar one per share. So having that beat, that's a decent beat. An eleven cent beat is pretty big. So that was that was very bullish. Um, the revenue came in at four point nine billion. The estimates were at four point eight one billion. So they they took it. They sold a little bit more than expected. Took in more more revenue. They raised the dividend from fifty one cents to fifty four cents. And they got analyst upgrades the next day. So this action right here, these little lines tell you that this happened after hours, basically. So they, I think they, did they report in the morning? No, they reported, uh, yeah, they reported in the morning and then they had their conference call right before the market opened where they guided up. And of course, after that, this day, the analysts upgraded them, which will usually pump the stock pretty well. So they had a nice, they had a nice jump. General Mills, if you owned it, was uh, was a wonderful, wonderful earnings season. So some, you know, I think General Mills, they make a lot of packaged goods and things like that. Some industries are actually doing really well. Anything that lasts on a shelf, you know, and is small. So like canned foods and uh, little, you know, boxes of XYZ kind of snacks and stuff. Those are going to do really well because people can order them on Amazon or whatever. Uh, they they last a long time. Now, fresh stuff is harder to do. Like grocery stores, they're still getting everything they need for their produce, it looks like, at least from what I can tell. But it's not as easy for them because they have to get it in a certain amount of time. I mean, you get the greenhouse stuff, yeah, whatever, but it's just not as good as uh, as the fresh stuff, which is in season for the Northern Hemisphere right now. So yeah, General Mills, packaged goods, uh, raising their, their dividend, analyst upgrades, guiding up, beating earnings, good stock. I, I like that one as a, as a long-term, uh, if, if it's anybody has it as a long-term investment, it's it's a nice one. Um, all right, so the next thing I want to talk about was Constellation Brands. I mentioned this earlier when, with Canopy, Canopy Growth. They reported earnings and actually got hit, which is kind of interesting. So here, here's what I like about the earnings season. You never really know. And also the numbers don't matter. It's all about guidance. Their EPS came in at $2.66 a share. Estimates were two fifty two, So that's a nice beat. Uh, their revenue came in at $2.36 billion. They were estimated at $2.17. So that's a nice beat. The last... Uh, time they reported i think last year in this quarter it was like 2 billion so they've gone up quite uh, quite a bit in their revenue met more revenue uh, more earnings for that revenue but what did they do they guided down then they got analyst downgrades which is why everything looks so terrible right now guiding down plus an analyst downgrade is terrible for your stock which I actually like Constellation Brands. They're still a little high from where I would like to get them, but they're a good stock. You know, they've been making money consistently. I mean, that's one thing about the pandemic and the lockdowns is like people still wanted their alcohol, right? I mean, what are you going to do when you're in there doing, you know, just hanging out? Buy a Corona or whatever. Get a, get a bunch of Corona to get together and watch some TV or watch some YouTube or whatever it is. So they're still doing well, but because they guided down, they're not going to look so good, which is why I like watching the stock for the future. Anytime a good company guides down. I love it because it gives you a chance to actually get in at a better price. I mean, I was looking at it when it was around 220 and right now, even after the drop, it's like 235. So it's still relatively up there in its range. And in fact, if I zoom in on the, uh, so you can see this range that they've had for, you know, months and months and months. In fact, let me back up a little bit so you can see that better. Um, they're just right in the middle of it. Smack dab. This is where price changes a lot. Um, so I can see there being some support here. In fact, if I go, let me get back to the other chart. I want to see the volume profile and where there is support. Now, I'm not surprised that the support main support is way down there because they pumped through like the entire 2010s, right? From 2013, they gapped up and never looked back. I mean, alcohol is a profitable business and they're high up on this range in the chart. I still, this is why I like it, but I'm not, I still don't want to get into it yet because it needs to come down a little bit more. I want to see it below this range. Like I want to see it close to the 200 mark, maybe crack that 200 mark, see where this gap is right here. If it can get down to that or crack it, you know, past the moving averages, oh, that'd be beautiful. But I don't think without a huge market decline that it will happen. Uh, so they're also, oh, that was the last thing I want to say. So the price action in Constellation Brands, because they have an investment in Canopy Growth, actually affected Canopy Growth. Yeah, as you can see there, it dropped right there. If we go to Canopy Growth and look at the same day, you can see they had a drop too, right? A couple days ago, the uh, Constellation brand reports, it affects Canopy Growth, even though none of that stuff affected them, except maybe their guidance. The Canopy Growth got hit. You know, so that's why when you're trading a stock, you really have to be familiar with what else it's involved with, because some stocks are owned by other companies uh, and the the movements of that company or that firm will affect the movements of the stock for no fundamental reason at all. 
which I love. So if a stock gets hit because of other stocks news, those are great times to buy. Right. And like same with Bitcoin. Like I love when Bitcoin just tanks on nothing. You know, maybe there was a huge uh, trade, like a whale wanted to get out of their position or something like that. See, I, I love that. It was not a fundamental reason. There was no hack. There was no fork. There's no nothing that, you know, there's nothing that would normally tell you to do that. Um, so you, it's a good time to buy. And that's the other thing I like about canopy growth. I mean, it was like three bucks. Now it's two. So I'm like, I'm liking this one right now, man. I've, I've got some contracts in it. Uh, I'm not trying to go too heavy because I really don't want to get crushed on any individual thing. Thing. Like I said, I want to hold mostly cash because I'm waiting for this Fed meeting right here on the 27th and the, the earnings season to heat up, right? I want the banks to go right in this area right here, and then everything starts to pick up, and I really want to get into to stuff going in around the 27th or so. Um, so no matter what, I'm going to be in some cash then, and we'll hopefully have a better direction of, uh, of the market at that time. Um, so let's see. Was that the last one? Oh, there was one more. Uh, SMPL. So they had an interesting... Oops, I got to actually click on that. So they had an interesting week. Uh, what was it? So yeah, Simply Good Foods. They they dropped on earnings. Uh, but it, it, this was another thing. Their EPS beat the estimates. Estimates were 35 cents. They ended up making 44. Uh, same thing with the revenue. Revenue was projected to be a two... 294 million but it ended up be th being 316 million so they made more or they took in more money for their goods they made uh, more profit because of it uh, they guided up for the rest of the year it was supposed to be a, like a 13 to 15 percent range of, of uh, uh, profit but now they're 14 to 15 percent so they're a little bit more confident that they're going to get closer to that 15 percent mark uh, they expect uh, adjusted EBITDA to grow slightly less than net sales growth. And they got hammered by the analysts. So really, they did well. Uh, they do have some headwinds, but they still dropped the stock. That's the, 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 the same thing that's been going on. You know, what did I tell you about these other stocks that had the same problem, right? It's Constellation Brands. They did well, and they got hammered because they guided down or whatever. Uh, this stock didn't even guide down. They did everything right, but... Because of the environment that they're in, uh, they got hammered, and the analysts downgraded them, which basically put the nail in the coffin. Now, I don't know a lot about this brand, but it's in food, uh, so it's in the food sector, so it's it's relevant right now with everything that's going on with shortages and and uh, commodity prices and stuff like that. Um, so that was that, that was what I wanted to bring to everybody's attention because you never know. Like I have rules about trading, and they don't always work, right? That nobody's nobody's rules are perfect. I like to say guidance and uh, analyst upgrades and downgrades are the two biggest movers of stocks. However, they don't always work like that. So you have to be careful when you're trading. You know, that's why I like a really beat up chart going into an event or, or a really over pumped chart. Like I want the move to happen first so that when the event actually happens, you don't get what you're expecting, which is how you make a bunch of money. That's why if you're able to go to buy contracts in the opposite direction or either share or go long, whatever the operation is or the opposite direction is in the stock itself, you can make money uh, it, when the direction shifts, if it does shift. Uh, that, I mean, because that, that's how you make You basically have to be certain about something that everyone else thinks isn't going to happen in order to make a good amount. Um, so that's why I'm watching stocks like this. I want to see a stock that's really beat up or really overdone going into event because I can either short it or go long on it, and uh, that, that can do pretty well. All right, so let's move into the last section, which would be cryptocurrency. Um, so last week I was talking about the Horizon hack. They have a, a, a cryptocurrency bridge, which is a way to move your crypto from one blockchain to another. The simplest explanation of how it works is there are some coins on one blockchain that are locked up. And then on the other blockchain, new coins are minted and you're in the same amount. And then you're able to use your currency on that blockchain. So Horizon, I think, was moving uh, Ethereum over to Binance or something like that. But like I said, those coins are, are locked up and then new ones are minted. So my question is, what happens to the coins that are locked up? Well, that's what hackers are going for. It's basically just gold kind of sitting behind a wall, right? Like if you're thinking about how, how people would protect gold, put them in safes, stuff like that. It's almost like you just took some gold and you stuck it behind a wall and said, that's good enough. People can't see it, so we're good. Well, somebody could just come in with, a, with anything, a hammer, a screwdriver, and, and tear up the drywall to get it. It's not that hard. So in that sense, like I know these things are protected and it's not necessarily easy to hack those bridges, but because there is a store of value just sitting there, they're an attractive target. 
And that's why these hacks keep going on. There was Horizon. Uh, there were like two or three others recently for the same kind of thing, these cryptocurrency bridges. Um, so the, one of the things I have in my notes is North Korea may be responsible for the Horizon hack. There was a uh, there was an article talking about that. I don't know how credible that is. Uh, you know, it, it's possible. So maybe we'll be able to track what happened with these hacks and correct it. Because a lot of times people lose... Uh, faith in cryptocurrency because they see these hacks going on all the time that's the problem with cryptocurrency the hacks don't don't stop and it's it's kind of scary because people aren't hacking the u.s dollar in the same way i mean there's a bunch of people trying to you know counterfeit it in different ways but you're not worried that like your u.s dollar is just going to go to zero tomorrow like cryptocurrency could because some hacker figured out how to how to mint an infinite amount of coins in their own name um so North Korea being responsible for that, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Uh, these hacks, I'm, I don't think are going to stop. I think these bridges are extremely vulnerable. Uh, we still have a lot to learn in the blockchain space, so they could really get hammered. Uh, we'll see the next thing. Uh, Tether has high short interest right now. So that's kind of interesting. Um, let me actually pull up the Bitcoin market so we can just see what crypto is looking like right now. So yeah, Bitcoin's not looking good. It's chilling down here. Tether, there's a lot of short interest on crypto in general and i like that as a as a sign that maybe we could reverse soon because part of what helps you reverse is the power you get from high short interest i mean shorts are basically like fuel to the fire they can be right i mean in my opinion honestly is short sellers are disgruntled longs right like they they used to go long but it always got crushed and they then they found out about short selling because that's usually what happens in the market you get into it you just think about oh i buy a stock and it goes up and i make money uh, and if it goes down i lose money but you don't think about the fact that you can actually ride both directions now the the, the catch is though if you're going to short you're going to be borrowing shares and you're paying in you're in interest fee on those borrowed shares. So it could be not worth it if that interest fee from holding it too long cancels out your gains. So that's one thing you got to worry about with with short selling is that you're not only, you know, waiting for the stock to move, but you're also on a time limit because you're paying for every day, every week, every month, whatever the time limit is to have those shares, which is why short sellers want to get out as soon as they can. If their positions are overrun, these short squeezes happen because number one, they're probably using margin and they get a margin call, which basically just means that the broker has decided that your level of cash does not exceed or does not meet the collateral requirements for the positions you hold. So they force you to either add money or sell. And most people, if they're short sellers, are disgruntled longs and they're going all in on these shorts because they like everything they bought got crushed and they think it's a way to just make a whole bunch of money. Now, there are good shorts. I'm not saying all, all shorts are like that, but more, most short sellers are just disgruntled longs that are providing fuel for the bull markets. Now, I don't think we're going to get that fuel until we shake out all this stuff with uh, the Fed and inflation and everything that's going on right now. But once all that gets settled, or at least settled enough that the market's okay with it, uh, short sellers are going to be the fuel that starts the rally. That's what happened in 2020 with the, um, let me switch back to the, the SPY real quick. If you look at the SPY, when we had this giant drop uh, from the pandemic, you can see that the rebound we had was extremely quick. I mean, this, this is like a month's worth of time right here. What do I have? I have it on days. Yeah. So if I switch this to the weekly, so you can actually get a, get a good look at it. I mean, look at, look at the, uh, look at the drop. Not very long. One, two, three, four weeks, right? And then the bounce was pretty much not not the same speed, but like this bounce right here was about the same as the, the drop because short sellers were providing the ammo. Down here, people were so pessimistic. I remember reading on the very lowest day down here on, was that March 23rd? Yeah, I just, I remember March 23rd so well. Uh, I re read an article from, a, I think it was like JP Morgan or Citibank or one of the really big investment banks that said, oh, this is just the beginning. We have so much more downside from here. Everything's terrible and we're all going to die. Like basically that, that article came out right in here. I remember reading that and thinking like, I don't know, man, we've gone pretty low and they just announced that they're going to be buying junk bonds from all these failing companies. So basically any company has a way to get out. I don't necessarily think they're going to, it's going to fall, but because most people were so pessimistic, they shorted the crap out of it and they got squeezed. So you got to watch out for that. I mean, the thing about the market is not only is it a forward looking instrument, but it's powered by inflation.
Okay, so that's the thing that makes me bullish on the market in the long term. If I back up, you can see that this market is extremely inflated. Yeah, we've lost about half of our gains from the past year and a half, but we needed to. Look at like the past decade. Look at how quickly the past decade went up. It went up slowly. Every year was a slight increase. I think we only had one like down year since the uh, uh, the 2008 crash, and that was 2018 because of the trade war and the increasing rates. So everything was up, but slowly, but look at the last th two and a half, three years, really, really quick. That is too much. There needs to be consolidation after a move like that. So this, this year, this drop we've had for the past six months is extremely healthy. It's a very, very good thing. And we should be happy that we're getting the opportunity to see this before things go even crazier. Because if this rally had continued even more, the drop would have been insane. And I mean, we may or may not be done. I would think that we're either sideways or down uh, for the next couple of months because of all the pressure we have. We could have some rallies. And if we do have some rallies, they're probably going to get crushed. Because here's the interesting thing. Rallies are bearish, believe it or not. Normally, a rally would be a bullish sign. You think, okay, we got money coming in. People can do this. Everything's looking good. People are confident in the companies again. A bull market is ready to go. But the Fed will see that as inflation being out of control. Because what happens when people have a bunch of money? They start speculating on things. They start trying to make more money in the markets. These huge fuels are because of speculators and shorts and people that didn't know what they were doing just jumping into the market when the pandemic happened and people needed a new way to make some income. You know, So there is a whole bunch of fuel just sitting there waiting to go. But we have to have the environment, right? We have the fuel, but we need to light the rocket. And the way we're going to light the rocket is if the Fed calms down on their inflation crushing, on quantitative tightening, QT. They're going pretty hard with it right now. They're trying to get interest rates up to higher than they were the last time it overwhelmed the market. They're winding down their buying of bonds, which is the big reason that the stock market is up. I mean, you could think if you have a bunch of debt, you can bond, you can create a junk bond, sell it to the Fed, and then work on paying that debt down. And now you have uh, some time because the Fed loan will give you more time to pay it off. You know, So all that free money that was coming in was was making everything go up so much faster than it normally would, which is unhealthy, which is why I'm happy that we're having that drop. We're having a correction to hopefully get the money back into the hands of the people that are going to stay in the market longer, right? These people, these Fairweather fans, they're, they've been mostly squeezed out a bunch. And some of them are still left, but they're probably going to get, they're not used to these down moves lasting more than a couple of weeks. So to them, this is really it. This is the end, but we need those people out so they can come back in for the next rally. That's what fuels the rally is all the people having FOMO and coming right back in afterwards. So this is really, really healthy. I'm very happy about this. And we, you should all be happy too. Everybody that has stocks should be happy about this drop. Um, so let me finish the last part of uh, crypto here, and then we're going to wind the, the show down. I'm kind of give you give you my uh, overall take and what, what I'm doing for the next couple of months. The last thing I wanted to say about crypto, or last couple of things, was the CEO of FTX says uh, some crypto exchanges are probably already insolvent. So the crypto, the crypto market depends on the price going up continuously. All these people that are buying in are are doing so at a heavy cost. So any in, like investment firms, uh, exchanges, things like that, they're, they need volume. They need people to be buying. And right now they're not because crypto has come down so much. Let me switch back to the Bitcoin chart so we can get a better look. This downtrend right here is killing the people that need volume. Like the exchanges are really bad. So that's why the, the CEO of, of FTX is saying that some of these crypto exchanges are already insolvent because they, they don't have the volume to, to continue to make money. There's going to be a lot of consolidation in the, the crypto exchange market. I think the bigger players are going to eat up some of the smaller players, and we're going to see a different landscape in the coming years, which isn't a bad thing because that's the normal cycle of business. Like there's a boom. All these businesses are created. People want to come in and capitalize on everything that's making money. Then it gets overwhelmed and it pops, it busts. So this market where everything's going down is hurting these exchanges that need the people to come in and work. Um, so that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's that's another bullish sign. Everything so everything bad is good, and everything good is bad. That's going to be the theme of the markets right now in the crypto market, the the stock market, everything. Because we don't want things to be too good, 
uh, which because that will incentivize the Fed to pick up the pace and crush the market even harder. We want the Fed to go more dovish. We want them to be more lenient. So we don't want to get too uh, – we don't want rallies to last too long. If, if there are rallies, which there are going to be, it just happens, they need to stop at certain points and continue to go down or the Fed's going to say, hey, we're going to jack this up harder, which will cause more of a drop. Uh, I'm okay with that, but – I, I would like to stay somewhat intact because even though I am, you know, largely in cash, I still have a good amount of money in my long portfolio. Uh, so I don't necessarily want it all to crash. But if it does, better buying prices for me, and I'm happy about that. Um, so the next thing, uh, FTX. Well, we're on the FTX topic. They're closing in on buying BlockFi for uh, 240 million. It looks like um, they let's see. They're struggling a little bit, and it's and it would give uh, BlockFi a 400 million dollar credit facility to draw from if they needed to. So this buyout would be positive for them if if it ends up going through. It's they've been talking about it for a little bit, so it, it, I think it is going to go through. But you never know. So um, if it does, that'll be somewhat bullish for crypto, not in a bad way. It's not gonna like pump the markets or anything. But uh, or it might, I don't know, for a day or something. But it it would consolidate things a little more, and it would allow the users of BlockFi some breathing room because a lot of these exchanges and uh, crypto mining or companies in general are just freezing people's assets. I think I have another uh, story about that, actually. Ah, there we go. Voyager tr uh, suspends trading and their deposits and withdrawals because Three Arrows Capital defaulted on a $300 million loan. Uh, and that's just one. I think they had multiple loans. So maybe I don't know if it's $300 million total or if that was just one section of their loan. But that defaulting on that loan was why they decided to suspend trading. And that's why I worry about the smaller crypto trading platforms, and I'm not going to get into one. Um, I'm looking at the bigger players because I don't want to get my assets frozen and not be able to take out my money. That's awful to have that happen because you really have no idea what's going to go on. I mean, when, when a stock halt happens... Sometimes the movement after the halt is relieved is insane. Sometimes stocks will drop like 90% or, or something like that because of the halt and the people that were stuck trying to get out. Because anytime there's a pause in trading, orders build up, right? There are a lot of people will trade with market orders, which basically means just get me the stock at any price, which I don't like market orders. I mean, I use them sometimes when there's high liquidity and the spread is tight. I'll use a market order just because it's easier and I know it's not going to get screwed. But if you put a market order in, you might get a terrible price. Like, let's say this, there's a stock that's trading at about $50, but the spread is like, you know, 35 for the bid and 80 for the ask or some like crazy amount like that. I mean, that's going to be really difficult to get in or out of that stock because of that huge spread. If you're playing that, you might. if you're stuck in that, you might not be able to get out at a good price. And if, if the stock gets halted for whatever reason, the buyers are probably going to drop out. So maybe you could have gotten out at 35, which would have been a $15 loss from what, you, what you're at if, if you're at the $50 level. Uh, but if those buyers drip, drop away, you might either be stuck with it or you might be selling it for 10 bucks, 5 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever it is. Um, so you really... If you're in a smaller organization, the odds of something like that happening go up, which is why I don't want to get into any of these. Like, I'm not surprised Voyager suspended trading and deposits and withdrawals because they don't they, they don't have the money because another company defaulted. Right. Everything is connected. You got to realize, like the money being used in one company came from somewhere else. It probably came from a bank or another investment firm. It's better to be if you're in crypto, it's better to be in a larger, more well-established company than these smaller ones because they're all companies. Not all of them, but a lot of them are coming out and suspending assets right now, which is absolutely horrible. I've The only time I've ever had my assets suspended was when there was an error with Robinhood. During the pandemic, they had like some shutdowns or something like that. Basically, the service went out for a couple of days and I had some some trades on. And when the service came back up, my trades were at a terror. Like I was up really, really high. Actually, I had a, I had a nice, uh, uh, position in UVXY, which is a, a volatility product that kind of tracks the market and goes up when things go down. I actually had a really nice temporary short, but I couldn't get out of it because it, the outage was it happened during the time that I was profitable. And by the time everything was restored, I was underwater again. And it was very difficult to get out of the position because the spread was huge. So I was basically screwed on that. And then Robinhood had some kind of error and locked up my capital saying like, Oh, you know, 
there was this like eight, there was like two eight thousand dollar trades that never happened, and uh, you know you're on the hook for whatever this this other amount is. And eventually, I talked. I was like, none of that was me. I don't know what you're talking about. And they they unfroze my assets after that. But by that time, it was so late that the the 2020 drop had continued, and I was way underwater. So I just took that loss. I lost a good like you know, third of all of my, my trading money at the time, which was awful, but that happens. So if you're in a, if you're in something like Voyager and all of your assets are frozen, but here's the thing, I knew mine were going to, my assets were going to be unfrozen soon. I knew it was just an error, but with something like crypto, you have no idea because the only way these companies would become solvent again is if crypto suddenly pumped that way, they would be able to pay back their loans, they'd have money again. But is that going to happen anytime soon? I don't know. So it's very risky to be in those smaller exchanges for crypto. So my suggestion would be to stay out of them if you can. Okay, so the other thing, the last thing I wanted to talk about before we wrap this up was centralization. So cryptocurrency is touted as being a... Uh, um, a decentralized, open, free thing that's supposed to save the world and make it so nothing bad can ever happen again, right? That's the crypto pipe dream, which, you know, you can believe whatever you want about it. I think to some degree that is true, but I think there is a lot of work involved to get it to that point. But with this crypto winner, what's been happening is centralization of assets and power has been going on. The exact thing that cryptocurrency, or at least most cryptocurrencies, say they're trying to avoid is happening. Now, why is that happening? My thought is because part of that is a law of nature. You think about the boom and bust cycles. It's not just in the economy, in businesses. It's in nature. You'll see that some years, fruit and plants are abundant. Animals are abundant. All the food is there. So the food chain gets this huge boost. Everybody's got food and everybody's multiplying. But then what happens? There's a drought. There's a storm. There's whatever. And a bunch of food goes away. So that the small animals that feast on those plants now aren't there. And the bigger animals that feast on the smaller animals don't have any food. So they start dying off. And then the cycle repeats. Eventually things pick up again and, and population expands. It's just kind of a law of nature. So I think with cryptocurrency, we're still on the uptrend, but we've been hit so hard that a lot of people are seeing this as the end. It's not the end. I mean, anything is possible, but I, I am like 90% sure that this is not the end. I think things are going to continue, which is why I've been putting more money into crypto slowly and only money that I am okay losing, but I've been doing that. People I've been talking to have been afraid and they've been, some of them have been selling, uh, some of them have been kind of buying. But my, my thought is like, if you don't believe in cryptocurrency, you shouldn't be in it in general. You should only be in an investment that you actually really like. But right now, when everything's getting crushed is a great time to buy. I mean, you're going to be down. You're going to buy something, and then the next day, the next week, you're going to you're gonna be down. That's just how it goes in a bear market, and you have to be okay with that. Because when things are going up, it's very difficult to catch that if you're not already on it when it starts. Which is why I, I say my philosophy for myself is to be slow about my buying. Don't just put everything in. Like, buy a little here, buy a little there. These long, trending down bear markets are the perfect opportunity to do that. I haven't really had, since I started trading, an opportunity to slowly buy in. It's always like like huge drop, big bounce, like every single time, like a couple of weeks, couple of days, we're back on, you know, not enough time to, 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 to be subtle about it, which is what I'm doing now. So the lower it goes, the higher my uh, buying goes. And that's just kind of the way we're, we're, we're headed at this point. So uh, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about. Basically, my strategy is I'm on defense right now. I'm laying low. I'm waiting for the increased volatility. So every that's what we're really looking for is volatility. What is volatility doing? I'm an options trader primarily. I do I more I, I like to invest in shares. I don't trade shares since I'm using a small amount of capital to do this. Uh, but I'm an options person, so I'm looking for volatility. When volatility is high, that's a chance for, for me to make money because volatility adds value to options. Options are leveraged, and they have all these factors that lead into it besides the price of the underlying security. A lot of stock, you know, you think like, okay, an option on uh, Bitcoin is, is just going to follow, you know, how Bitcoin moves. Yes, to an extent, but there's also the volatility involved, like how many people suddenly want to get contracts, how many people think that the, the stock is going to drop or go up or whatever. As, as the market trends in a certain way, market makers add value to the price of these options. So they get more and more expensive. Volatility is the reason that happens. People who sell the options want to make a little bit more money so that they're protected if there is a move that comes against them. Basically, the way options work is somebody has to sell 
sell an option and be responsible for either buying the shares or selling you the shares. So having high volatility can make it difficult for that long buyer, right? So the long buyer is, is, is hoping that the stock either goes up if they bought a call or goes down if they bought a put. The uh, seller is hoping that the stock either doesn't move or goes in the op opposite direction so that they're not responsible for the shares. Because like, if you're selling a put, you're basically saying, all right, if the stock goes below this, I will buy your shares for that price. So if you somebody says, all right, I'm going to buy the $100 put, the seller says, okay, I will sell you this put and I will buy your shares at $100 if the stock goes below $100. If it doesn't go below $100, that option is worthless. The seller gets to keep the premium that the buyer paid and the buyer is out 100% of their money. So that's how options work. And they most options expire worthless. So the buyer is at a disadvantage. The seller is at an advantage. But the seller knows that when times are volatile, they need a little bit more in premium to protect themselves in case that actually does move against them. So they charge more. And that's an opportunity for a seller to, to make a little bit more because once volatility goes back down, that premium shrinks. And if you're a seller, you want that premium to shrink, but that's what you're looking at with an option. You're looking at high volatility when things pick up and a chance to make money if you were an option seller. So I'm both a buyer and a seller. I don't just go one way with those options. I want to make sure I have as many uh, strategies as possible. Even though the odds are against the long buyer, I've made more money going long Long than going short because going short is difficult with a small amount of cash. You have to do spreads, which means the m amount of money you collect is being eaten into by the protection you buy for that spread. So you sell one option and you collect the premium for that, but then you buy another option above or below it to protect against a move well beyond. As an option seller, you're going to have to take on more risk than the profit you receive from it. So that's why volatility goes up. Those people are putting, the option sellers are taking a big risk, even though the odds are in their favor. So they want to make sure they're collecting enough to cover that. Um, so that's what I'm waiting for. I'm just staying on the down low, waiting to get, take advantage of the volatility. And I'm looking for plays that are in the heart of earnings season. So I kind of told you before that there's an order to this. So the banks, like I said, start it right about here. And then the heart of the earnings season is, is here. And then also in August, if I sw switch over to August, you can see there are quite a few, you know, 700 companies here. Here. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at who is reporting in that heart, as I call it, and who can I make plays on? So the, the sections are the preseason, which is just whatever random companies kind of start to report really early on in the quarter. Then there's the banks, right? They started off. This is what I was saying. I'm repeating this from earlier, but I'm going farther with it. So the, after the, you have the preseason, you have the banks, and then you have the heart of earnings season. That's when all the, you know, this stuff happens right here. And this is why I'm looking for plays in the heart. And the final stage is the cool down. That's when the last of the companies that you don't know haven't heard of don't care about our reporting and uh, there's not really a whole lot of money to be made right there if you if you don't know those companies like me i know the company's more in the heart of earnings season and the bank's section of earnings season than anything else so that's what i'm scoping out i'm trying to have as much cash as i can to make a move on something that is incorrectly priced when an event happens during that time because it's going to be so hard like with the fed coming out right in the middle of that with you know earnings already being so crazy with everything else that's going on there's just going to be so there's going to be so much opportunity for price action to go against where to, what it should be. And that's what I'm looking for. I want a horrible, horrible movement in price action so that I can take advantage of it. Um, so yeah, hold cash, stay low, look for that. That's my, that's my, uh, uh, strategy at the moment. And for the next couple of weeks, because it's, you know, we don't have the fed meeting until, uh, the 27th. So we've got, let's see this week to three weeks before that actually happens, two weeks till the fed go. So nothing. Basically, I'm doing nothing for the next two weeks. The only thing I have on right now that I can show you is a Rite Aid short. You see that? I mean, their chart looks terrible. They're, they're a wonderful short, but you don't you don't make a lot on them. So they had they had this little pop right here. Uh, I, 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 I think I started shorting in here, but I, I picked it up right here and bam, it fell the next week. So that short was looking really good. Uh, what Everything I lost on the pump, came right back on the dump. So I'm I'm basically break even. I'm a little bit over break even I think right now. But if the market continues to trend down a little bit, then that I'm going to take that short off the table close to 6. If I can get it down to 6 bucks, you know, especially if it goes below 6, like it went below 6 for a little bit. If it can go down to 6 or below, I'm taking that short off and taking my profits because that'll be nice. I started that short somewhere around 8 bucks and it's already at 6.85. So the the short's doing pretty well. So that's basically it. I'm just kind of hanging out making these little trades waiting for the the meeting. If there's any 
questions or any comments or anything people want to talk about, go ahead and throw it in the chat. I can do that because I got to wind this up here and get to a few other things. So I've just kind of started this stream. It's relatively new. I'm still kind of practicing and figuring out how I want to do it. I'm not really advertising that much. I'm trying, you know, I'm telling my friends and some people on my social media, but I have a lot of work to do and I need to make things a lot better for each stream basically. So next week, I'm not going to stream. I'm going to take a week off, but I'm going to work on making things better. So hopefully the week after that, I'll have better audio quality. Um, I'll have a plan for you. There's really not a whole lot going on anyway. Like I said, the next two weeks are, are for me, going to be kind of slow. Uh, who knows what happens? Something crazy could happen. But for the most part, I'm just going to be hanging out. So I'm going to take this opportunity uh, for next week to to improve things and skip the stream. I might roll something in the, in the place of the stream. I don't know. But as of right now, next week, I'm going to skip. But after that, I'm back on my main schedule. I need to kind of figure out how to do this. Because even though I've, I've been doing this for like three or four months now, which isn't that long. And I'm only doing one stream a week, sometimes two, if there's a special event, but it's, it's, I'm already feeling the burnout a little bit. So I need to figure out a better way to, uh, to do this, uh, which might mean that maybe one, one stream a month. I, I don't do, um, I, cause I'm going to need some time to just take a break and not do anything with the markets, you know, cause all week, you know, even though I'm doing everything else and this is only a small part of my life, I'm still thinking about this stream constantly, pretty much every day. I'm making notes when I see stuff. I'm going through news. Like I do all my trading and then I look at everything else that I want to talk about in the show. So it's become this, this really, you know, big responsibility. It was supposed to be just kind of this fun thing that I did to vent a little bit, but I'm taking it a pretty seriously and I'm trying to improve it. And, uh, it's, it's becoming a really difficult. So my thought is so next week I'm going to take a week off. I'm going to kind of reassess how I do that. I can't, I want to continue to do the Sunday night finance things, but I also want to do some streams during the week, just regularly. Uh, I want to try to do some other stuff, you know, maybe some gaming stuff, some just chatting kind of things. Uh, eventually I want to set up a camera. You know, I'm doing this from this kind of little studio setup that I've got going at a family's house. Uh, so I'm trying to improve that a little bit hopefully put a camera in but we'll, we'll see how that goes but anyway point is next week i'm going to be taking off from the stream maybe I'll, I'll air some content in the place maybe not but after that it's back on i hope i can see everybody there when it is looks like we don't really have any questions it's kind of a slow day i'm not surprised it was a slow week as far as uh, the markets and trading go so stay safe out there there's so much fud going on right now fear uncertainty and doubt people pushing that it's hard to know who to trust so listen to your gut don't completely ignore your mind but you know make sure you're being safe with everything if you don't feel right about an investment just don't make the investment even if you miss out on something and you feel bad like oh i should have done it only make an investment that you feel good about like your your mind and your body both agree that it's a good investment that's what you're looking for so be safe try to do that be ready for the volatility that's going to come up because we have like right now things are, are moving down but it's not very extreme. So let me take one last look at the SPY before we head out. You look at even though the, the moves have been pretty big in the past few weeks, our area, our range is not that different. This like uh, 380 to 370 range, we've been, even though we, we gap beyond that, it seems like we always come right back to the section. So for the past one, two, three, four, five, six, seven-ish weeks, we've been in this range. So I don't necessarily know if the range is going to stop until we get the crazy earnings and Fed thing going in late July. Um, so that's why I say be safe. You know, talk to your financial advisors. Make sure everything's going good. And uh, if you have some cash and you're making moves, be ready for this because this is going to be interesting. You know, even though these next couple of weeks are going to be boring, I guarantee you when things go go live at the, in late July, it's going to be a madhouse. So I'm getting ready for that. All right, I'm going to take off, get the rest of my weekend done. Thank you for joining me this week. It was really fun. Uh, we had a, a lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of things to go over. And I'm sure when I come back, it's going to be the same thing. So no market on Monday, no uh, stream next week. Be ready for the slowness and the volatility. I'll see you later. Cheers.